Jason Derulo can do it because he says stuff and sings stuff in his songs. But should he? You're a good producer, Khaled. But you're taking an L. An L! Anyway. <laughs> welcome to the Big Damn Cast. Uh, uh, nerdy news, geeky gossip, all the stuff that's fit to occupy your time until we shuffle off this mortal coil. <laughs> or into this mangled spiral, based on that manga yes. you show me pictures of. Yeah, I read my first Junji Ito manga this last week, and uh, Uzumaki is real good and real fucked up. So, speaking of real good and real fucked up, welcome... Welcome, welcome one and all to the Big Damn Cast. Listening on iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, and quite possibly Spotify. Spotify, baby! It took us 40,000 years, but eventually the check cleared and we we're have on Spotify. Arrived. Uh, so if you are listening to us on Spotify, hi. Sorry to be interrupting I'm your so uh, sorry. beer and wings playlist uh, as you uh Can you some imagine? News. Can you imagine if that? Thankfully, pod, it doesn't put podcasts on music play, playlists. But if the like the few uh, radio dramas and such that are on there, it does put them in playlists. Oh, so I have had it before. I've been I've had like a shuffle playlist on, and all of a sudden, a segment of Big Finish Audio has just come on in the middle of two songs. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "This is not Metallica. <laughs> but this is Nicholas Briggs." I've just gone. From... <laughs> <laughs> I've just gone from death. To Nicholas Briggs going Rob Lowe. Well, he's he's one of the things we talk about this week. Um, we've got a oh, oh, bunch of news. Oh, oh, young sirs and madams. But first, to make things clear, in case the court listens back to this, uh, I am Chris. How's your father, Watson? <laughs> and I am Matt. You ain't never had a friend like me, Onsen. Yes, see, what I did there. Yes, I switched our surnames yes. around. And that makes us elusive and mysterious. What? I don't know. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, up front, if you're looking at the picture and the title for this, you're probably thinking, oh, they're doing another Doctor Who episode. No, uh, we're not. We're no, not. but we are we're covering not. this because it's interesting. And it did it did excite me. First um, peek at the next series. Yeah, yeah. like uh, not only has it started filming, they've got bold enough to just say, yeah, here's a photo. Like, here's a picture of Jodie Whittaker. Well, they've got to keep us, you know... As the 13th stroke, 14th stroke, 15th Doctor. They've got to keep us lubricated. <laughs> Until 2020. Yeah. That's a lot of lube. That's a lot. Um, That's a long time. I think the reason they put this out there is because they're length. doing some filming in, I think it's Gloucestershire. Yeah, you've got to get ahead of it. Oh, in Gloucester, sorry. So, yeah, so they, they, they want to they wanna make sure it doesn't get spoiled by other people, so they're releasing their own still from the set of the previous day's filming. It looks like we're getting a returning alien to Doctor Who. Last series, sort of notoriously, was like, we're not having any returning aliens. Mm. And so there were, they did not have any returning aliens. Um, except for one, except for ones that they created and then made return later in the series. Yeah. Um, we got the Dalek in the New Year's special after the series had wrapped. And now we're getting the Jadoon back. And Nick Briggs okay. has confirmed on Twitter that he's, re- he's reprised the role of the Jadoon captain. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nick Briggs never wasn't the Jadoon captain now, let's they, be honest now, but here's the thing right so you could have other people voice the Jadoon you could and and but Nick Briggs would sue you they should have no but like they should <laughs> if they did they should have done he's it he's litigious is Briggs eh <laughs> they should have done it earlier because we've had three we've had four Jadoon captains appear in the world of Doctor Who already in terms of the TV stuff we had um, Smith and Jones who they first rocked up in series three and we all went this is a great concept yeah. space rhino police Brilliant. Um, Pretty good action figures as well. Yeah, there was some rocked up in The Stolen Earth. Because that's when David Tennant, for some reason, talks back to them in Jadoon. And it's like, hang on. What? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. I liked it. Um, we had one rock up uh, and briefly say some lines in uh, uh, The Pandora Opens. Yeah. And then one of them, which is the best use of them to date, 
Yes. Was in the Sarah Jane Adventure yes. story, Prisoner of the Jadoon. Yes. Um, it's very good. It's so good. It's so much fun. But Nick Briggs voiced them all. So I guess that's just a, oh, every Jadoon captain has the same voice. Fine, whatever that's called. Cool. Like Cybermen and Daleks, I get. It's because they're a race of, of vat cloned identical warriors who all wear black armor with don't. Oh no, that's on That's on <laughs> Well, they're all played by Dan Starkey now, so it's the same thing. Um. But you know, it's, it's like yeah, fair enough. Like, fair, cool, whatever. It means it means that that character, those aliens, feel the same, which would be nice. To be like, oh, cool, these guys are back. This is nice. Yeah. Twelve plus years after their debut in Smith and Jones, um, and arguably twelve years since any episode about them in Doctor Who. Fucking years. Oh no. Jesus. Mental, isn't it? Shadarsh uh, da, but um, they changed them a little bit. Just a little bit. At Just least this Jadoon bit. captain. Well, the armor looks sort of a little more, a little cleaner and everything. Considering these costumes have been in exhibits and in storage for years, yeah, they've been maintained well. This Jadoon captain seems to have a little bit more of a gut, like his upper half is more pronounced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is like fair enough. But dude's got a mohawk, and yes. I saw Batman March on Twitter compare it to a summer's day. Um, compare. Compare him to a very Bebop and Rocksteady this vibes is a coming from this slightly overcast Jadoon. mohawk. It is. It, <laughs> it does look like they've stuck a, a, a broom like on top of its head. Jadoon platoon on the moon with a broom. Yeah. <laughs> on its doom. Doesn't make sense. On its coming soon. Didn't make sense not to live for fun. Shh. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I like that. I know a lot of people have been mocking it online, but I'm just like, no, do you know what? If you're going to bring them back, do mess wait, with them. Wait, Make people it so that are they mocking things different. online? <laughs> Fuck off. Never happened. Not in this, not in this country. Uh, but yeah, I, I, you know what? It kind of makes me happy that they've out of the gate just gone. Yep, yeah, here's a preview of one of the episodes you're not going to see for a year. And it's got the Jadoon in it. The the Jadoon see you next coming. year, folks. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we got a shadow release at the end of this year. If perhaps it started with a Christmas special or, or started in December. That wouldn't surprise me at all. Because um, production does take a while, but this looks like they're already in the swing. Maybe this we'll this get... wasn't a production has begun, because I think that was actually two months ago. Maybe we'll get a New Year's special, because um, maybe that can become the new tradition, where the, the series starts with the year. Yeah, I'd be down for that. We're getting, it, we're getting more Doctor Who in 2020. You're getting a New Year's special. And that's it. <laughs> Next uh, series, 2021. Oh, God, no. Oh it's God, a long no. series. Uh, yeah, the Jadoon one is actually just a webisode. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. The Tardisodes return. Tardisodes in 2020. They were great. They only did one series of them, didn't they? Series two. It's almost as if they spent a lot of the early revival series throwing ideas at the wall to see what stuck. Oh, you mean like that doesn't happen now sometimes with this show and several others like it. Speaking of which, Constantly. a Doctor Who VR game was announced this week as what? well. Second uh, VR game to come out of Doctor Who in recent months because there's another one that's coming out soon featuring an animated version of the 13th Doctor. That's, that like the, a, that's like the TARDIS game. flight sim thing. Isn't yeah. It? yeah, which looks really... It looks like the best way to put it, it looks really cute. Fly the TARDIS! Like, it looks like a really cute game. But... They're releasing another VR game featuring uh, monsters and locations from the 55 years of the show's legacy, according to the press release. So Destiny, the Doctor's remake. That would be amazing. I'm not even kidding. I'm not even kidding. You are the Graal or whatever. I'm not even kidding. Remake it and have um, Michelle Gomez reprise Missy and do Ainsley's bits. Oh, beg your pardon. (laughs) Have Michelle do Ainsley's bits. Okay. Ain, 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 Ainley's bits, not Ainsley's bits. Give him a good rub. Whatever that I got, no. <laughs> Ainsley Harriet, Ainsley master Harriet. confirmed. That'd be amazing. I'd love that. Um, Give him me a good rub. <laughs> he's just slapping a bot line. No. He's walking like, <laughs> Master, I knew it was you. <laughs> you have to give me a minute. I'm just preparing dinner. Ooh. Lovely. Um, Lovely. <laughs> he's a very large man, is Ainsley Harriet. <laughs> I had to crouch beneath a table with him on two separate occasions. Is, is he 68 <laughs> feet tall? He is 68 feet tall. And, uh, spoiler alert... Chris is an the, enormous the... bee trying to ram through you into the was. It, it, that's Mothra. Oh, okay. It's come to fight no, Ainsley Harriet. that's out for another couple of weeks. It's come to fight Ainsley Harriet. 
Ainsley Harriet, Godzilla 2, King of the Monsters, confirmed! Yeah, oh, yeah, in the trailer, you know, they're like, like, we've got to give it all hail the king. Like, what they've not showed you is the last shot of the film where Ainsley Harriet comes Actually, out. Actually, Ainsley. Grabs Godzilla, snaps his neck, and then bastes him. So. Bastes him, good this sir. This is all in the new Doctor Who VR game because we have totally played it. It better be. We yeah, have. I mean, it was. <laughs> we yeah, have for sure. It was, yeah. But, um, yeah, a couple of stills were released this week, specifically one of the inter- interior of the TARDIS. A couple of gloomy looking locations and one a close up of a Dalek that almost looks like it's saying hello and still because it's so close to the visual um, to your vision in the game. So yeah, a lot of Doctor Who sneaking out under the radar over the coming months. Oh yeah. And I would be interested to see if there are other um, returning elements to the main show. Yes. Um, whether or not they're going to continue to be like, here's an image of them so that we don't get people creeping on down to the set and spoiling it for everybody. Did we say pause? What now? What? Hmm? I just sneezed. Meat. <laughs> oh, what's the fart? <laughs> um, some other stuff's happening in the world of TV. What? So you know this Disney Plus thing? Right? No! Yes. Um, <laughs> so, it's been confirmed that Winter Soldier and Falcon, Falcon and Winter Soldier. Yes. Six episodes. Yes. And apparently Daniel Bruhl and Emily Van Camp are apparently in talks to reprise their roles as Zemo and Agent 13 slash... Sharon, Sharon, I'm sure I kissed my great uncle once Carter. <laughs> she won't mm. remember. Uh, or will she? It's all, it's all the, it's all fucked up because of the snap. Well, I'm glad. So I'm glad that she's. I'm glad that she's not been dropped by the wayside entirely because she is great. And it always felt like she they wasn't really given the platform. Though, yeah. yeah, in the film, like her role in the Winter Soldier is exactly what it needs to be, and she brings a lot to it considering it's very minimal. Yeah. Uh, to the point where that you know we see her in Civil War promo promotion when that was about to come out, it was like, oh yay, oh cool, like I wonder, and she are they going to carry on that romance? Nothing. She doesn't do very much at all. Um, but so her being used again is great. Very happy to see Zemo returning in oh, whatever yeah. capacity because Daniel Bruhl again, excellent actor, and for two people who are totally fine with what they did with the quote unquote Mandarin Nine Man Three. I was a bit miffed that we didn't get more Zemo mm. closer to comic Zemo simply because, you know, that would be awesome. Well, spoilers for Endgame. We may not have Captain America in the story going forward, but we have someone who's taking up the mantle. Yeah. We have somebody who is the psychic of Captain America and has been Captain America themselves. Yep. It feels right that Zemo would be in the series. We're Aye. getting a Captain America villain in the Captain America show. Do you think at some point he's going to whack on a dark purple balaclava when he's doing a stealth thing or whatever? And it'll be like, there it is, there. It won't melt to his face or anything. We won't get that much. We'll get that far. If it gets a second season, do you think we might get cyborg bodied, TV bellied, Anim Zola? Mm, I wish, but I think they'll leave. I think they'll leave Zola alone now. Cause... I think they'll. I think they'll leave him be because he's, um, you know, he had his big glorious send off as a monitor. He did. He did. In he did. Winter Soldier, but, but I'd it like would to see be that wonderful in the chest of a cyborg body. Nineties crangs. Can well, can Toby Jones play the cyborg body? <laughs> play the cyborg body and also like, be on a screen on the chest yeah, of the cyborg. Hire body. him for a day. To have his his head, yes. on you know, and it's like, oh god, it's Arnim Zola, yes. and then the head's taken off, and it's just a little camera, but still, just have him mocap the whole thing, so it feels like a complete waste of the actor on set. Yes. <laughs> so there's a five foot three Arnim Zola wandering around, and we see behind the scenes photos of Toby Jones with a green sock on his head. Yes, <laughs> but an image of himself in his tummy. On the subject of five foot three. <laughs> okay. Apparently, there's a. I found a petition out there that's gained around 5,000 signatures oh. for Danny DeVito to play the MCU Wolverine. Right, it's not going to happen, guys. <laughs> it's not going to happen. And also, it's not a good idea because no. he's, he'd be a better puck. Ah! Yes! <laughs> yes! He can't play Wolverine because he's going to play puck in the Alpha Flight Disney Plus series. I think everyone's just saw that he wasn't Detective Pikachu and they really want him to be in a big pop culture thing as a, as a big name character. What do you mean Dumbo wasn't a groundbreaking, <laughs> wasn't a huge pop culture phenom- phenomenon? The visionary remake of a classic, a beloved Disney movie that everybody absolutely loves and doesn't treat as some sort of weird um, 
historical oddity. Yeah, more on that later. Hey! Uh, the Disney remakes, at least. Not historical oddities. Speaking of historical oddities, though, um, DeVito being petitioned to be cast as Wolverine just makes me think of uh, Wizard Magazine in the 80s and stuff. Oh, doing Bob that. Hoskins yeah, yeah, yeah. Should have yeah. been Wolverine. No. No. Uh, like, late 70s Bob Hoskins, possibly, but not late 80s Bob Hoskins. Is there a star out there you think could be a good Wolverine? Current current day? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Um, in an alternate reality, Brolin would be a pretty decent Wolverine. Yeah. He's still a little too tall. Yeah. But I think, you know, he's like, he's a good like seven inches shorter than Jackman, so I think we can get away with that. Um, mm. did you see you Jackman doing a little Wolverine bit during his show? No, no. He, his, his big musical tour at the minute. The, what is it? The Man, the Music, whatever it's called. The Man, the Music, the, the, the Mutants. A, there's a bit with a drum solo and stuff like with him and a bunch of others are doing stuff on drums and... and sure. It's sure, amazing. Sure. And it, it, there's a clip of it online that he reposted where it ends, the routine ends and he's just sort of like his arms to his sides like, yeah, as he's done it. But everyone's cheering and he just sort of for a moment because he's got the drums between two, drums yeah. between two fingers he just starts going like, ah, like clawing it. Nice. Everyone cheers. Obviously, they're going, "Yay, Wolverine!" Oh, God. And he, uh, there he is now, and he does it. And then he, um, he sort of goes, uh, "Let's see Ryan Reynolds do that." In reference to the drum thing, and he reposted it on Twitter with the caption, uh, "Sand line drawn." Sand line. Nice. <laughs> nice. Like, okay. Like if Ryan Reynolds now joins in for part of the tour just to do a drum solo, I'll be very happy. I love the I love their ongoing quote, fake quote unquote beef. Yeah, it's brilliant. The, the vodka uh, or whatever it is, advert the vodka is, the gin adverts is wonderful. Just fucking pours out. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. It's um, really, really I, I'm enjoying what they're like together. Which is which is why it really sucks. We're never going to see his Wolverine opposite Ryan's Deadpool in no. any way. But, but if Deadpool obviously but, becomes amalgamated into the MCU's umbrella, as it appears he will do, we can hopefully have a gag in a Deadpool film where he like gets Hugh Jackman's autograph or something and says, like, I feel like we knew each other in a past life or something. <laughs> you know I mean? Have a scene where they're both on screen together, but Hugh Jackman is played by Hugh Jackman and is Hugh Jackman, not Wolverine. That Huge would be lovely. Ackman. Huge jacked main. Um, but yeah... How the hell did we get to that? Um, How did we get to Wolverine? Oh, yeah, who could play... A, have you got anyone in mind? Who could play a good Wolverine now? How tall is Zac Efron? I'd suggest that too young for me. He's not that young. He's Zephyrs. Yeah, he's like 27, 28. Um, a bit older. 31, okay, yeah, 32. Yeah, I suppose. I want a Wolverine with a bit of mileage, but at the same time I understand that they probably would skew younger. <laughs> On purpose, After just seeing so... him in the, Well, we've got that with the Batman casting. Right. The, the supposed Batman... Has it been confirmed? Well, here's officially? the thing. No, but Variety's headline was... Cast as Batman. And then the article is... Is amongst the names being considered as an apparent, and is apparently top of the list. So it's not been confirmed. Like, until Warner Brothers put out a tweet. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's not confirmed. But the internet has gone with it. However... Zac Efron is 32 is a year older than me. No, to, 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 me, he's, he, to me, he still radiates 20s. Like, that would distract me if he was Wolverine. You should watch the Ted Bundy thing. Zac Efron is Scott Summers in the MCU. Don't hate it. Do you know what I mean? Like, because he, he could actually... He would bring an interest publicly to Cyclops that would then help in assisting the public image of that character. Because that is an interesting character. Like... You know, Boy Scouty, like, you know, uh, oh, I'm the leader of the X Men character who basically turned into the biggest prick in the entirety of X Men. Zach Efron could help that story be told by just being him, being cast as him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. People yeah, would I be guess. like, I'm interested. I, I stand Cyclops now. Great. Starters, stop using that expression. Secondly, we're going to now take Cyclops in more interesting directions and distract you all from the fact that Wolverine's not in this movie. Which would yes. be nice. I would um, love to see a, a proper MCU X Men movie with no Wolverine. I'd love that. I would love that. Yeah. OG Five. Because you know he's going to be in Dark Phoenix somewhere. They'll find a way to put him in no. somewhere. That, that that prisoner transport unit or something. They'll put him in there. Oh god. They'll find a way. What the 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 way they the way they shoved him into Apocalypse. They the, will find a way. The train sequence that they allegedly reshot to be the climax of the movie that's in all the trailers. 
Yeah. Oh god, is that? Oh, is it? Apparently so. Oh jeez. Ale- uh, yeah. Sorry. Oh Jean. Allegedly, the uh, the train sequence that we've seen in the trailers was the the new is the new climax that was reshot. Good added, god. Then changed from whatever it was originally. Who's the director of this one, guys? It's Kimberg. It's Kimberg, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know. MCU, X Men, take your time, but focus on other characters. Do Fantastic Four first. Yes, please. Um, I think we've already said like who we'd want in that, haven't we? Like, who we'd want to play who? Did we? Krasinski for Richards, please. Krasinski for Richards. Blunt for Sue. Oh, so good. So oh, what's that? They, they, man and wife played a believable man and wife in a film where they were man and wife. What? Do it again. <laughs> and, and, well, think about it. Reed Richards has been sporting a beard for quite some time now in the comic books. Especially since this revival. Yes. They are Krasinskiing Reed Richards up. Yes. They're making him look more like Krasinski. And now that Evans is gone, it's time for Krasinski to step up as one of the leading figures in the MCU. Yes. Let's Why do it. Why not? Let's Ruddy do it. Why the hell not? Who are we thinking for Benjamin Grimm? Oh, uh, I want a mocap performance. Yes. Because uh, Professor Hulk and Thanos, like they've proved that they can do it in a way that looks great. And they were so good. I need someone... So it's got to be someone with really expressive eyes in particular. Someone who can communicate a lot with their eyes. And somebody who believably would be the best friend of Reed Richards, sort of around age-wise. Um, you know who might be a really interesting choice? Go on. Depending on where he is uh, weight-wise, because he goes all over the place with it. Go on. Jonah Hill. You know, I don't hate that. I don't hate that at all. Because I think he could capture... Ben is a very warm character, and I think he could bring that to it. Yeah. Um, plus, I love the idea of Jonah Hill and Mark Ruffalo in ping pong ball suits in a mocap studio having a fight at some point. Not even the fight of Hulk, because you know they're going to do Hulk and Hulk v Thing at some point, and give us all that fanboy rush of "Yay, these two legendarily like to scrap." Like, but I would even more than that pay money to just watch those two in in diving suits in a mocap studio pretending to punch each other. <laughs> That'd be hilarious. I think Johnny Storm would be the young unknown of the cast. Young unknown, or um, or you go for because uh, if the X Men are going to be a particularly young cast, Johnny Storm could be the slightly older, you know, hothead pun intended, who who's still clinging on to the teenage years by being a massive kid. Yeah. So somebody in there, somebody in their twenties or what have you. Um. This is all conjecture. Yeah, but... Why are we even well, conjecturing Krasin- about Krasinski this? and Blunt for, for Reed and Sue, and I'm happy. Yeah. Um, which would be great. And again, it would it would drive people's interest, because they'd be like, wait, John Krasinski and Emily Blunt in the Fantastic Four? Yeah, I'll fucking watch it. Like, it would bring people back to that property, I think. Yeah. Um, but you're speaking of casting, let us, uh. let us glide back to Gotham. Um, Matt Reeves, the Batman, is casting, which means that production is... Bat Reeves. Well, production would not be starting until at least next year then. Like, this would all be pre-pro time. Or the end of this year. Because whoever's cast in the role will be given a shed load of time and personal trainers to get them to a point where they can be Batman. Um, Nick, I don't know. I Nick Holt is one of the West names. I love that. Style shape Batman. I love that. Nicholas Holt is one of the names that's been teased and with him about to be let go by Fox I I can't blame him for putting his name in the ring. I don't I don't think for Batman. I don't see him as Batman. Like nothing no beef I just I just haven't liked him in anything. Yeah. I've never well about a boy. (laughs) Oh okay. There we go. I forgot about that. If we could if we could if we could uh, use the time stone to get about a boy Nick Holt and cast him as a Tim Drake Robin then maybe. But the main name doing the rounds that everyone seems to believe is playing him, but we'll wait until the Warner Brothers release. It's basically been reported as confirmed by every outlet. Yeah. Despite it not having been confirmed by anyone. Internet journalism. See, we, we are doing a form of journalism in that we are talking about news that we've looked into and we are putting it out there in this context. We're basically one step away from GAM journalism. Well, that's the thing. We are... Essentially, unpaid versions of what the majority of internet journalists are doing now, which is repeating something they've seen, 
difference is we read into it a bit more because we don't want to sound like dickheads and our stuff is an opinion piece not a factual entertainment piece yeah um so many of these outlets have said this is the truth if it turns out to be the truth they're all going to just go with yeah well, we knew that but what they're reporting is english actor robert pattinson is going to be cast as batman in matt reeves the batman on the count of three, let us each make a noise to suggest how we feel about that. One, two, three. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. pretty I, much. If if I don't hate it, it's not my first choice, but I don't hate it. What I would do if you cast in Robert Pattinson is don't do super jacked um, MMA cage fighter Christian Bale Batman. Don't do CrossFit. Oh. Mad Gaines bra bat fleck do odd moody bizarre quirky quirky Michael Keaton Batman yes like because he because Robert Pattinson regardless of what you think of Twilight has proven himself outside of that to be a an interesting performer who mm. does weird and interesting projects yeah so well, again like 80s Keaton this yeah. is a man who has done some weird stuff yeah some terrible stuff some great stuff but he has always been an incredibly interesting element so lean it. into that aspect because if you just want they're they, not ca- you know, the internet obviously was referenced twilight they're not casting him because he was in twilight that series ended nearly a decade ago people do not cast him because of it, twilight. it depends what you're looking for from a batman yeah because if if you are just looking for someone to get jacked and look good in a suit like you're not really line going up, for the interesting up, part of yeah. the Line them up around the fucking block. There's so many people. Just class the fucking model, for crying out loud. Yeah. But if you want someone to actually be odd, um, Bruce Aloof, Wayne. weird. Can bring that kind of aristocratic charm to well, the Bruce Wayne persona, why... but then play the, the weirdo, quiet guy for Batman. The reason why Ben Affleck works so well, in my opinion, as Batman, is because Ooh. he was playing a version of Bruce Wayne who was broken and embittered and damaged and had cocaine just to the side of yeah. the camera between takes didn't take it but knew and it, it was yeah. there and, and he got was... more annoyed over the course of the day that he couldn't have any yet and he was you know he was allegedly he was being played <laughs> by a Ben Affleck who was broken and embittered yes, and yes. you know damaged yeah uh, so it, it, that's why I kind of, I actually really like Batfleck even in Justice League because he is just so uh, and it kind of works for the character because well, he's just you're wrong but uh, <laughs> like he's just so I don't give a fuck anymore see I think that's why I, lo- I love Keaton so much is oh, because Keaton's he's, just because weird. he's, he's I love not him. that and it's I so love odd him ball. and a lot of that is Tim Burton creating an oddball version of a character that he as a director so clearly doesn't give a shit about because he's focusing on the villains instead but that gave Keaton free reign to be weirder. I love it when Bruce Wayne is odd. Mm. Like, not just, not just like, oh, he's such a, you know, playboy and he's buying hotels and bathing in the, 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 in the ornamental pools, uh, buying a restaurant so he can get a nicer table, like the <laughs> Chris soup. Nolan ones. Soup. It's cold. Gazpa- is it gazpacho or something? Like, it's gazpacho, sir. It's supposed to be cold. And his reaction is brilliant. Because <laughs> his reaction, any other actor would have gone like, oh, Alfred. But he doesn't. He sort of goes, oh. And just carries on eating it. <laughs> uh, uh, do you know what I mean? It's like, that is such an odd way to behave. Or the, um, <laughs> the, di- the, the dinner scene. The dinner scene. Like, tell you the truth, I don't think I've ever even been in this room before. <laughs> And, and the thing is, when he, the way he says it, it doesn't sound like he's flirting or trying to be funny. It genuinely sounds like Bruce Wayne's like, I, I'll be honest, I don't fucking recognise this room. Because yeah, like, like, uh... he obviously, obviously he's and been then there, just go and... he doesn't remember it because he's always preoccupied with other shit in his head. And then they just go and eat with Alfred in the kitchen slash dining room. And it's, it's adorable. Fucking great. And then they have semi-sex up the stairs and then they possibly have sex and she wakes up and he's dangling from a workout bar <laughs> in a doorway <laughs> from his feet. <laughs> Like just oddball Batman. There is so and much to love in those t- in those Tim Burton. Stick movies. Robert Pattinson in a suit and 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 sort of photography and whatnot, inspired by like the Jay Lee 
version of Batman. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That sort of slightly lankier, um, sort of the really uh, uh, sort of odd spiky cape at the end. Well, he looks like a kickboxer and... instead of a grappler. Yes. Yeah. I'm I'm game for that. And also, just again, as an actor, like guy can play a decent range. And like everyone. Let's see him play someone who seems collected on the surface, but is actually an absolute lunatic. Everyone points back to Heath Ledger now. Like every time mm. someone goes, "Oh, they shouldn't have cast X as Y because you know they can only do this." Well, Heath Ledger. Yeah. So you know, um, of course there are outliers because when they first said Jared Leto was cast as the Joker, for example, like, same character, but they said Jared Leto, I was like, okay. Because that was like straight off the back of Dallas Buyers Club. I was like, "Yeah, all right, I'm, I'm up for seeing that." And then, oh, we, the, and then we saw it, it, and it was the case of, "Ugh." But it, oh, it, on top of that, it was the back, back in the back of my mind, just con- the constant thought of, "Yeah, but Jared Little's a prick." Yeah. Talented performer, no doubt, but also a prick. Just reminded me. I once thought that McConaughey would make a good Joker. <laughs> But then I remembered, no, I want McConaughey to play Norman Osborn in the MCU. Mm. That'd make me very happy. A younger Osborn who can get his fingers like dirty, get his fingers stuck into everything and get his hand dirty. All right, all right, all right, Spider-Man. So, Spider-Man. <laughs> Spider-Man. She, seems I figured out your identity, Spider-Man. <laughs> you're, my, you're my son's friend, Spider-Man. <laughs> or I'll crush you like a bug. <laughs> oh, here's the ultimate test. Back to formula. <laughs> Back to formula. I out. Am I? He's too chill. He's too well. Yeah, but that's when you put the mask on him. You let the actor's freak flag fly, which is exactly what will happen. When Robert Pattinson is definitely cast as Batman in Matt Reeves the Batman. If all all else, out of everything else, that says to me that if that's the direction they're going, it's very much defining this this series yeah. as a separate ass entity from the DCEU. Yeah. But it does make me wonder, they're obviously gonna use Batman less in the DCEU if this is the case. Because originally Matt Reeves trilogy was a Ben Affleck trilogy that was gonna star Ben Affleck and be set either just before Batman v Superman or after the Justice League. Then it was confirmed that Affleck was going to be directing and producing it, but not necessarily starring in it. Then it was hinted that it was going to be a prequel trilogy. Mm. So a younger actor would play Batman and Affleck would be producing it only. <laughs> then Matt Reeves was in charge and Affleck announced he wasn't involved anymore. And that's when Warners were like, we're doing Joker, which has nothing to do with the DCEU. So now the belief, of course, is this Batman series will have nothing to do with the DCEU. Or Joker. Or Joker. Um, casting Pattinson would definitely set that tone. Like, yeah, this is this ain't this ain't your daddy's DC movies. My daddy's DC movies are the Chris Reeves Superman. All right, no, I meant like the shut up. But it wait, does make wait. me wonder if they're going to downplay uh, Batman in the DCEU. They could totally recast that Batman and still have that Batman around. They'd just be playing the same incarnation as the Ben Affleck one. So who replaces Ben Affleck in the DCEU? Mm. Mm. or do they go hey Ben Affleck look we're not going to do a full film you don't have to work out for nine months at a time to like stay in gorilla shaped Batman sort of physique yeah that was a large Batman yeah um, you don't have to do that but you're going to be Hulk style in Ragnarok in another character's film can we film with you for like a month? Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm sure he'd come back to do something like that. Because he's not stepped down as Batman, has he? He's stepped down from working on the, the Batman No, no, films. he's stepped down as Batman. Oh, did he make a statement? Yeah. Oh, no, I'm, I'm getting confused with Cavill, who's not made a statement. Um, But his representative said, yeah, no, he's left. Like, he's left. And Warner's went, no, he hasn't. Our relationship with Henry Cavill is really good. And then Henry Cavill posted that weird Instagram p- video of him playing with a Superman, a boxed Superman <laughs> toy. And that was it. It was like, what's going on? And then wasn't in Shazam. And wasn't in Shazam, which I think um, has been confirmed by the filmmakers. He was going to be in Shazam. That scene was planned to have him sit down, have a conversation, and you're like, oh, and then the credits. But for whatever reason, he wasn't able to make it. I think they said it was scheduling conflict. Yeah, I heard that a lot. And as a result, they went, right, we we have to go ahead. Did. 
and are happy with the version we got and I think the version we got is better because of the way it is because it keeps the focus on and also on Freddy and, and it Shazam would, it would just kill the momentum of that ending as well yeah oh, the, the, the fact that the ending is just like what and it cuts to credit is perfect yeah like, it keeps it moving perfect. whereas if you stop and have like a fucking five minute conversation you're just like yeah. oh come on already this is cool and all but if you'd sat down and just gone like hello that would have been that would have worked do you know what I mean because then you go oh shit and then it ends and young kids watching the film go oh it's Superman not oh it's a Henry Cavill cameo yeah. <laughs> like, Henry yeah. Cameo Henry Cameo VLL. <laughs> Henry Cavill yeah, he's gonna be cameo busy. He's, got, he's got Witcher in to do yeah, some sweet ass witcher in with that terrible fucking wig. I've seen Cavill suggested online for Wolverine. Nope, but I don't think he's charismatic enough. <laughs> nope, to play that character. Wolverine's got to be a likable dickhead. So I don't think Cavill can do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing blanks. He can play, for he can play vanilla charming. That's sort of his thing. He plays vanilla charming. Vanilla charming. And in Geralt's case, Love vanilla it. and white. Love um, it. Is it Geralt? It is Geralt, isn't it? Geralt, I think. Geralt of Rivera? Geralt of Rivera? Well, you're the one who's played Witcher 3. That's true, but have you noticed that I've not played Witcher 3 for a little bit? Because Because I'm not an RPG playing Spider-Man. Yeah, well, I'm playing the DLC, fam. You know what I'm saying? I'm also playing a lovely game of getting fleas off my dog. Ah! It just leapt back on her. Oh my god, sorry. I'm killing a flea on the recording. I'm committing a murder on tape! Is it dead? It's dead. Lovely. This okay. Is, this is now a snuff podcast. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Speaking of snuff, um, uh, what's the body count like in John Wick 3, Matt? Oh, my days. <laughs> John. Did it make you tickle your parabellum? It did, actually. <laughs> so Imagine if it was called John Wick per- a Perineum. John Wick <laughs> Chapter 4. Has been greenlit. Has now apparently been greenlit for April 2021. Uh, where there was some doubt over it because in interviews for this, Keanu Reeves was saying like, oh, I just don't want to get, you know, I don't want to kill the series with sequels. He has not. Because John Wick <laughs> Chapter 3 Parabellum is really fucking good. <laughs> like, it's like a consistently strong series because it knows exactly what it is. Yeah. It is... I mean, him doing a lot of the press for this, he keeps referring to it as like, we're doing it in that, that John Wick style, or we're bringing that John it, Wick... And it to is! It, it is like, its own style it's now. It's already at that point where they can refer to it that way, and people go, yeah, I get what you mean. And it is literally, <laughs> they get a bunch of, of uh, stuntmen, slash actors, slash action stars, slash actors who do a lot of their own action work, and just chuck them in a, chuck them in a room. <laughs> and see what happens like this has got the um, Matt DeCascos is in this as sort of like and he was like big 80s action karate star dude he was in the Double Dragon movie that's right okay, yeah. I, I was trying to think where I don't remember him most of the 90s and 2000s like the late 90s and, and 2000s just like relegated to straight to video sci-fi original level shit yeah um, well you know steady work yeah, but, but not, like, not the height not of like, where he could be he could do better yeah if it had worked out for him, but it didn't. And then he's in this, and he's fucking brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Because they've looked at him and gone, he'd be perfect for that. Oh, yeah. Get him in. Yeah. Um, Probably against studio wishes. You know some of the studios are like, well, why haven't you thought about this net? And they've gone, nope. But I feel like this is one of those <laughs> franchise. this is a franchise now where people are just like, uh, the producers and the writers are just like, oh, we want to do this. And the studio just look at the numbers and go, do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> I miss working with Lawrence Fishburne. Right, he's in the film. Oh, <laughs> every single line of dialogue Lawrence Fishburne has in this movie is pure gold. Pure fucking gold. Because you haven't seen the second one, have you? No, I'm, I'm catching so, up this week because you guys reintroduced Lucy to the first one, didn't you, on Tuesday? Oh, the first one is just brilliant. she fell asleep the first time we yeah. watched it together. Um, to be fair, she'd had a very long week. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're going to watch number two. Uh, we're, uh, today's Wednesday recording. No spoiler alert. We're going to watch number two, I think, tomorrow. The second one's on Prime at the moment. Yeah, we're going to watch number two, and then we're going to go see number three at the weekend. Yeah. It's... Ooh, just... <laughs> they escalate They escalate the violence and the just the technical the prowess of the action on, um, on display. There's actually a little less gun-fu in this one. Okay. And because two of the... Ba- Everybody wants gun-fu fighting. Yes. In a moderate kind of way. 
like Mark de Cascos's two um, sort of lieutenants who have a who have a long fight scene with. Um, I thought you said Mark, uh, Mark de Cascos is is two lieutenants. Yeah, no, I was like, oh, oh my god, only one of him. Um, but they're they're the dudes from the raid that were in Force Awakens. Yes, yeah, and they are amazing <laughs> because. And the great thing is with those characters, this set of characters, mild spoilers for John Wick Chapter Three, um, <laughs> is that those characters that when they encounter John, they're like huge fans. Okay, I like the mind of Cascos character as well because he's so well known as a as an assassin in this sort of crime wor- underworld thing. Yeah, and just like, oh my god, John Wick, it's an honor to fight you, and then fight to death, <laughs> like. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, well, that's what I loved about the first one is there is that almost comic book mythology to it within itself. Yeah, and this goes even deeper into that. But the way the movies do it is they just they don't like front load it. They make they tell you exactly as much as you need to know, mm-hmm. and then just dangle some other bits in front of you. So in terms of that supporting cast, does that does that give you an element of that? It looks like Halle Berry, for example. Halle Berry's in this. Her inclusion was some that uh, Keanu was really happy about in a lot of the interviews. Yeah, I think he suggested her for it. And they, they did consider some other actresses, including... Um, which would have been interesting, like Marion Cotillard uh, was... Sorry, was could you pronounce her name correctly, please? Cotillard? Cotillard. Cotillard. Um, apparently they looked at... They, Thought about Eva Longoria and Salma Hayek for that role, but I don't think they would have been good fits. Um, She's got dogs, right? Yes. There's some dogs in the Apparently movie. Halle Berry actually actually does the dog trainer on the movie as well. Oh, okay. But they had... Um, I'm game for that. The way that she uses them in, in the fight is incredible. And it's, again, <laughs> as far as I can tell, it's almost all practical. Again, yeah, and a like, lot of the interviews he's been saying that they, they try as... as their mission from the outset with the action is to try and use CGI there is, only to blend and and There is and some CGI as as in this that, and you're like, oh, that's CGI, but it's only in bits where you're like, yeah, that there was no other way they could have done that. Yeah. Okay, because that makes it sense. It is ridiculous. There's there there are again mild spoilers for John Wick chapter three. Um he does kill at least three people with a horse. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> This has brought up three possibilities in my head, that sentence yeah. alone. One of them, he kills people whilst riding a horse. No, no. Two, he kills people using slash in tandem with the horse. Or three, he just picks the horse up and no, hits people not, with it. It's not the latter, it's, it's, the, it's the middle <laughs> one. He does kill people while riding a horse, okay. but he also kills... Or maybe it's two. At least two people <laughs> he kills with a horse. <laughs> I was just picturing some Looney Tunes style shit that he just drops a horse yeah. on someone from a great eye. No, no, none and of the that. the horse turns the camera goes like, hoof, because he's like, winded, you see. More like, wait like for it, wait for it. Animal. Get him in the right spot, get him in the right spot, slap the horse, horse kicks dude in the face. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> there you go. Um, um, they're, good at, they're good at wielding their weapons then. Does this film make good use of Ian McShane? <sighs> The most loaded gun there ever was. Let me tell you. <laughs> Let me tell you that this almost makes up. I love for you, how Hellboy. Wasted in Hellboy, he is. <laughs> no, 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 no. He got wasted in Hellboy to get through making hey. Hellboy. Um, no, I, lo- I love you, Hellboy. As, as Thanks, the, demonic floating head on CGI body. As with the previous two movies, um, Ian McShane's Winston continues to be a fucking delight <laughs> um, backed up as well by um, uh, Lance Reddick's Charon who is the concierge yeah. at the Continental and um, this time opposite uh, the new mysterious villain uh, the Adjudicator um, who's sent from the high table to sort of oversee the um, the retribution visited upon John Wick Mm-hmm. Um, and poor John sanctioned though any of those who may have who may have helped him and uh, they're played by Asia Kate Dillon which is uh, cool because Asia Kate Dillon is non-binary and by all by the way that they are treated and referred to in the film it would seem as the character is that as well yeah because they don't as far as I know they don't refer to them the, the, pronoun, the pronoun the pronoun is, is an open pronoun yeah. they, they and them yeah. good um, on them man 
Wait, good on her. And she, uh, she, she, they, ba- badass as fuck. They are um, fucking brilliant. Um, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to check Age of Kate Dillon's pronouns to make sure I'm, I'm using the right ones. I, if she's she, fuck. If they're non-binary, then I. Hey, like it's, it hey, it's an ongoing thing. The point is that you're you are yeah. op- open to and actively seeking to learn. So uh, that's the important yeah. thing. Yeah, it's they. They okay. But that's brilliant because then that means that they are being represented in a way non-binary performers are being represented in a way that they've not really been up to this point in mainstream media for them to give them that bad. It's a part. little thing. It's a little thing. But it's a little thing, but it's it's a sweet little sweet little button. Yes, it's a sweet little button to be like. Oh, by the way, did you know? Um, so that's cool. Um, and now I want to see educate Dylan in more things. Uh, who else? It's one of those movies where loads of people turn up and you're like, "Oh, it's that person." It's such a folk. Um, like it's Jason, thingy dude. Jason Manzukis is one of um, Lawrence Fishburne's like homeless network of assassins. Because anyway, with Lawrence Fishburne, because you, you haven't I seen the second one. I did wonder what. Yeah, yeah. He's, yeah, he's the Bowery King, so he's got like an underground network similar to the Continental Hotel chain, but yeah. it's all he runs it from the underground. Okay. The, the literal underground. Oh, okay. And it's like, uses like, homeless people as their runners. So sort of like Baker Street Irregulars and Short yeah, Combs' is home, a homeless network. Bit like that. like that. But for people who do's the killings. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, then that becomes a, that gets looked into in, this, in the second one. There is just, so, it's worth watching just for the, technical proficiency of action filmmaking and the way that the fights are shot and are so clean and easily followed mm-hmm. um, in, in contrast to so many other action movies. but And, and the inventiveness as well on display. Like there's a, there's an action scene early on which is in a, uh, takes place in a weapons museum. Okay. And oh, okay. So it's lots uh, presumably of... all empty weapons, right? In well, terms there's... of the oh god, because of these like maces and there's a great moment with John dismantling a bunch of different revolvers to try and cobble together one that works. <laughs> um, oh, that's a great idea. Um, Fuck, you and... know that they've been sitting on this stuff for ages, going, yeah. How can we make this work? There is. Where can we put this idea? There is a, uh, and it does it does climax in a a big bun in a. In a room in which lots of knives and axes are thrown. Oh, good lord! Yeah. Okay. It, okay. It's a uh, pincushion central. <laughs> oh no! Also, a slight one. And if you don't like eye stuff, there is a particularly nasty ice cream moment in the first twenty minutes or so. So just be aware of that. <laughs> Going into this movie, have it um, in your head, folks. Yeah, uh, have if, it in your head because I know some people. Uh, Kinesis trigger is. Uh, ice cream stuff she doesn't like it at all yeah um, so it was a bit of a whoa moment good luck because usually this these kind, this series has, is quite discreet with the, I mean it's bloody but mm. you don't see a lot of like outright gore but there is one particularly gnarly moment early on and I I I am shocked that this movie is a 15 because it is so violent it could be to do with the amount of time spent yeah. with the gore in frame because there is towards the end, there is. Because what were we watching um, the other day? We, we, they live. It was Lucy's first ever time seeing they live. Oh yeah. And um, well, I'm so, I'm still kind of surprised that's an eighteen. It, this was the most recent DVD release of it about two years ago. Well, but I think the, I think it's because of the amount of violence. It won't have been reclassified as well. So yeah. that's the thing. All the movies don't get re- don't tend to get reclassified but unless it? they're new cuts. But it, I think I think it's the I think it's the amount of violence in it. There's not a lot of gore in it at all. But it's the and, and the fist fight. For example, isn't a bloody fist fight. It's hilarious. It's there's a lot. Hilarious. Of, there's a lot of gunshots in it, and a lot of point blank gunshots. So I think yeah. that's why it's an eighteen because it's just like, oh um, my god, it's also great. And she fell in love with it at the end of it. She went, that was fucking brilliant. <laughs> like, yeah, welcome. They live is fantastic. Now every time you see someone with Obey written on the hat, you could be like, you have no idea where that's from, and also you spent way too much on your damn hat. I should watch <laughs> some more John Captain movies. You, you're okay. This one, real, real fucking ugly. ugly. <laughs> um, you know what I want to revisit because I've not watched it for ages. John Wick two, <laughs> Prince of Darkness, Prince of Darkness, John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness. You know, I've never seen it. One with Alice Cooper in. Yeah, I've never seen it. It's really good. <laughs> 
I haven't seen it for years, but it is just... There are some cheesy effects in it, but it's at, some of its, its creepiest moments are actually stuff where there isn't, like, weird special effects going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, can, I can't tell if you're winking at me or if you've got something in your eye. I've got... I've got um, Dog in my eye, yeah. Oh, no. Bloody hell. And so, you know what it is, is... Um, Apologies, listeners, for the graphic nature of what I'm about to describe. This podcast is now an 18. The way my allergies manifest tends to be the um, the mucus in my eyes thickens. Mm. Oh, so I'm just yeah. like, oh, oh, oh. yeah, oh, God, that's me with them. Um, um, yeah, be all right. Yeah, I'd be fine. Um, Do you want antihistamine? Will that help stay? No, I'll be fine because I'm, I'm, I'm going home when we've done this. So you're already I'm home now. Babe. You're still projecting this. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm actually asleep. Oh um, my God. It explains a lot. But yes, John Wick 3, it's fucking good, man. Like, get along to see it. Catch the second one on Amazon Prime if, if you haven't. And I don't know if the first one's streamed anywhere. I've got it on Blu-ray, so. Um, but yeah, it's a cracking good time at the cinema. Very Fun violent. For the whole... Do not take children to see No, no, no. No, no, no. 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 But no. yeah, just, it, it, it is a high bar for action filmmaking. Um, there isn't really anything on that level. There's been stuff that's that's like Atomic Blonde was a good example of yeah. taking that um, genre, that sensibility, yeah, and applying it to in this case spy fiction, um, Cold War era spy fiction, and also with a female lead with uh, Charlize Theron in that is just incredible. I think it might have been the same director as the first. I think it was David Leach who directed okay. um, Deadpool two as well. Could be. Deadpool he, 2's he, got some pretty damn solid action he, as well. Deadpool 2's got some amazing, like, close quarters gun and, and hand-to-hand combat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, the, stu- um, the stuff in the, uh, the stuff in the, in the, the, the convoy, the prisoner transports, is brilliant. Especially with Domino. The way she, she and Cable fight is really well shot and really well choreographed. Uh, yeah, so, um, Chad St- uh, Stahelski, um, and David Leach co-directed the first John Mick, although, David Leach wasn't credited. Um, oh, was that was that a director's guild thing? Or, uh, I'm not sure. Or just uh, oh no 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 I'm I'm the producer I'm I don't don't credit me you twats. But uh, he you big boogers. But don't give me a paycheck. Chad the Haleski's directed all three of the John Wicks. Yeah, so far, and he was um, he knows Keanu really well because he was his stuntman on the Matrix. Yeah, that's where the relationship um, started, wasn't yeah. it? Because he was like, "I, I am you." Yes, <laughs> but yes, Chad. Yeah, uh, David Leach then went on to direct Atomic Blonde and Deadpool Two, and in- including the the uh, related No Good Deed and Ashes shorts. Um, right, so hang on. So no Good Deed was the, the, the was the, the, was the trailer a year teaser. prior where he fails to save a yeah. guy, and Stanley physically cameos. Yeah. And says like, "Hey, nice suit or whatever," and he's like, "Zip it, Stanley!" Yeah, <laughs> like, this is great. And he also directed and Ashes the, is the Celine the music, Dion the music, Celine video. music video. Brilliant. Um, Brilliant. He's, <laughs> his next directing gig is Fast and Furious presents Hobbs and Shaw, which oh, I think might be good. That might that no, not might. That is that that's tipped me now. I'm gonna go see it. Yeah, I'm I've, dev- see I've it. not seen any of the Fast and Furious movies since the first one, but I think I'm gonna go see Hobbs and Shaw. Idris Elba is a genetically altered superhuman terrorist. There were two trailers. Versus Jason Statham and The Rock. There were two trailers for it when I went to see... Um, and it's vaguely about driving. When I went to see John Wick. <laughs> uh, one of them was The Rock's character being asked about Jason Statham's character. Oh. And the other one was Jason Statham's character being asked about The Rock's character. That's really good. <laughs> that's cle- that's clever. Um, yeah, it. they're definitely playing off the... Uh, These two guys hate each other. But they're gonna have to work together. Thing, <laughs> like, I love that was it, the trailer. It looks like it's almost a comedy. Yeah, because like, it's so ridiculous. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Um, and then he's got Undying Love, apparently, which is an Image Comics adaptation. It's in pre-production, and then he's also attached to the um, Enter the Dragon remake, which I don't want. But at least we know the action will be in safe hands. And it'll be yes. shot beautifully. So David Leach has sort of taken that um, action aesthetic and taken it out to other things. And then Chad Staheleski is... Uh, is, <laughs> is 
<laughs> kept with the... Sorry, the dog's dreaming and her face is doing John weird Wick. things. Oh, Chastaleski also did some assistant directing on um, Civil War. Oh, there you go. And, uh... Yeah. Probably so... for the action set pieces then. Yes! Yeah, so oh my well, god, I bet it was for the Iron Man Bucky and uh, Cap Close Quarters fight. Yeah, because it's that kind of very, very well choreographed ve- and it's not quick cut. Mm. action oh that beautiful shot in the the, the, the the featured in the trailer and it was like yeah. oh my god yeah, where it's yeah. just like the two of them wailing on Iron Man uh, with his back to camera that's so good mm-hmm. god damn great action's great when it's great isn't it and th- great action is John Wick chapter 3 Parabellum slash can't wait for chapter 4 it's a long title Action directors can direct the hell out of action, but you know what they can't direct the hell out of, Matt? Tell me. Musicals. Oh, no! Now, I'm sure that's not universal, but last week, a no, preview it's clip with... No, oh, hey, hey, hey. A preview clip came out for Aladdin, featuring a minute of the Prince Ali sequence. Um, and it was underwhelming as hell. Flat, weird direction, odd auto-tune on Will Smith. It did not impress. A bit like Will Smith's career post Wild Wild West. Hey, <laughs> don't at me. Jim West, Desperado, <laughs> Rough Rider. No, you don't want nada. <laughs> None of this. Six gun in this, brother running this, Buffalo Soldier. Hey, Look, it's like, it's I, like told I told you. you. Any damsel that's in distress, be out of that dress, dress when, when she meets Jim, Jim West. West. Oh, got rapey all of a sudden. I know, right? Um, <laughs> uh, but anyway. Um, we were not impressed by this clip. We thought it was a bit gross and a bit, oh, that's... Mm, not that was yeah. gross and like... It wasn't offensive. It was just like, oh, this is a well, bit... Well, it's offensive weird. to me. Do you know why, Matt? Because my goddamn favourite Disney movie from my, my childhood was Aladdin. Because you got problems. No, no it's because it's a great movie. And How also, many problems have you got, Chris? 99. Okay. And the genie is now one. But, oh, um, no! That makes it 100. It's... Oh, good Lord. Around 100. Oh, the soundtrack to Aladdin, uh, which will be out by the time this podcast is out, the film. But the soundtrack to Aladdin has already debuted on Disney's Vivo. I guess they're just getting ahead of any pirate copies. By yeah, why not? It. Um, also, building height, building if, height, building, building, building height. If you want to be in the under five hundred thousand club, now's your chance because people haven't obviously been replaying it and revisiting it after the movie yet. So all the tracks are in between like ten thousand and two hundred thousand plays. I am a sucker for pain. <laughs> I love the original movie so much. It explains I love the, a lot about your underwear draw. I love the Broadway and West End adaptation just as much, if not slightly more. Yeah. And as a result, I was like, I have to listen to some of the tracks. Yeah. I've got to do this to myself. Jasmine has a new original song called Speechless. It's not great. Um, bless, <laughs> bless, um, what's the actress's name? Oh, Naomi Scott. Oh, Yes. She does a good job. She does a good job. The song's not great. Um, one Jump Ahead is not an amazing version in comparison to the original. The energy of the original and the Broadway one still pips it. Prince Ali is an audio, and I played a couple of these to you before we started, didn't I? Prince Ali is an audio. I think it works really well as a track. Like, it's a decent take on Prince yeah. Ali. But it shows what disservice Guy Ritchie's directing and the editing does to the songs. Yeah. Because that minute clip of Prince Ali is just bland and odd and you know in purple peacocks he's got 53 as a bunch of normal colored peacocks go past the frame you're like wait hang on what like at no point did anyone go shouldn't these be purple <laughs> as the lyric is describing do you know what i mean just little things like that where it's like they if no shits have been given here to the direction of this scene it's just flat and odd. Yeah, as an audio, that track works quite well. Yeah, it's okay. It's not the best version. There are two better versions already in existence. The original and the Broadway version. But it's alright. It does its job. Um, we then listen to a bit of Arabian Nights, which is longer and a scene setter. And sung by Will Smith. Emphasis. Sung by Will Smith. Not rapped. I not, mean, a little bit Not rapped. styled out. There's a bit of... Not in Arabian Nights there wasn't. There's a bit, of, the, a, bit, a bit more the vocal feel delivery. a bit more... Sort of spoken. Spoken than yeah. sung. But he's hitting that chorus. Yeah. And there's a bit of sort of non-obvious sort of tune, like sort of equalising is in, in the track. But it's like, okay, Will Smith can hold a note, man. 
Yeah. All right. Okay. This is nice. It's, it's different enough from the original and the Broadway one that it's it's like there are now three introductory versions of Arabian Nights. Four if you count Return of Jafar slash the animated series, but that would be too weird. <laughs> but there are three introductory versions of Arabian Nights that lead into a version of the story Aladdin. And this is one of them. And it is all right. It's got its own identity. This is nice. Great. Okay. I'm curious. How does Friend Like Me sound? Yeah, avoid it. Avoid it. Friend Like Me just sounds mm-hmm. flat. Like, the musical arrangement is brilliant. The choice to make it a little bit more hip hoppy in the beat is a good shout to differentiate it from the other versions. But it's just flat and dull in comparison to not even, you know, just the Robin Williams version, just covers I've heard. I did it for a vocal freaking assessment in Performing Arts Year One. My version's better than that. Yes, I'm sucking my own willy, but it's delicious. Like a pudding pop. Would you like to try this alcoholic Fuck drink? Fuck no! Okay. Um, but you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's flat. It doesn't work. Wait, your penis? Yes. Okay. Um, what song? Yeah, it's fine. It's, 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 some say theirs is a grower, not a shower. <laughs> Mine is, mine's better as just a show and tell presentation and then nothing more said. Um, so, and so. Uh, but then we delved even further. Ladies and gentlemen, this song has an, this film has this an film. end credits song. Oh. Much like many Disney's. Oh. The live action Disney's haven't done it as much. but it the, the touches of it. It very bad. Right, let's look at the pros and cons here. Pros. It's a Will Smith track yeah. made especially for the film, which yeah. has some rapping in it, referring to either the events of the film or the characters. I feel like that's only Cheesy a as hell, pro but because you know, it's nostalgic for the 90s when Will Smith would write songs for the films he was in. Wild Wild West is a terrible movie, but did we or did we not, without hesitation, just recite some of the lyrics of the verse? Oh, yeah. It sticks in the mind. It's entertaining well, it and works as its own thing. What's the track it samples? Uh, it's a Stevie Wonder yeah, uh, track. I can't remember the name of the track. I mean, Same with Men in Black samples a Stevie Wonder track. Oh, Jesus. Do they all sample... St- is, is Will Smith just made his career I think of sampling Stevie, Stevie Wonder. Wonder? Yeah, we're good. Um, that's Wild Wild West. I'm having a moment. Here come Men in Black. Yeah, yeah uh, to send me forget-me-nuts. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't think it's Will. I don't think it's Stevie Wonder. But still, uh, yes. samples. This is sampling the map. Look it up. That right. worked. This is sampling. It's sampling, sampling Friend Like Me from Aladdin. Sampling the thing he's in already. Yeah. But it's sampling Friend sure. Like Me, and it, it's only using bits of Friend Like Me in it, but the musical arrangement there, and it's a decent resampling. You can play with and resample the music of Aladdin to great effect. I'm going to pull up now a very brief bit of a uh, friend of the show that we've never met him. Um... I Wish is the uh, 1976 song by Stevie Wonder that Wild Wild West samples. Yeah. Uh, Lemon Demon, a.k.a. Neil Cicerega, uh put out... <laughs> yeah. know, among, amongst his Amongst his... Well, he's, he's did Wow Wow, which is amazing. But amongst his unreleased material, which he basically put out as whatever stage it was in, he released one called Prince Ali, which is officially titled Unfinished Prince Ali Remix 2008. It's me and my friends had plans to organise a flash mob of people dressed like Aladdin, holding loaves of bread and dancing to remixed Aladdin songs. Basically a real life version of our second life greeting. Uh, This never happened. Yeah. (laughs) So that's that's it. But he put up a minute sample of it and there's a tiny bit of it. So this is him just remixing Prince Ali from Aladdin. Fair use is parody clause. Here we go. Just little things. Mm, mm, mm. That, that, that bangs, right? That yeah. pops. I, I get it. I like, get here it. We go. Skip ahead to the chorus I feel a little it. bit. I feel it. Bit to the chorus. So you can uh, get a sense of that majesty. Mm. Your majesty. Um... Oh, for Pete's sake. Ah, uh, YouTube's not working. Point is, it works. Yeah. This does the same thing, but there is one giant con of Friend Like Me end credits version for Aladdin. And that's the inclusion of its producer, DJ Khaled. Now, DJ Khaled, uh... for those who don't know, is a music producer and, um, like, sort of audio king. 
essentially. The guy gets acts together, he, he produces on the tracks, he, he makes collaborations happen that wouldn't normally happen. Yeah. Kudos to him for that. He's also an obnoxious, egotistical prick who DJs his own sets uh, and wants to be the face of his own thing. He doesn't take an L, Matt. He no, doesn't take no. an L, but he does chicken out at the third stage of a Hot Ones interview after shipping his own wings out there. But he doesn't take an L, Matt. Even though he chickened out at stage three of ten, he doesn't take the L, ever. It's about learning, Matt. You don't lose, you learn. Are you sure? You never take an L, bro. But this is rigged, though, right? Give me your wings. Nah, this has got to be rigged. I hate him. He's obnoxious as sin. And amongst the reasons he's obnoxious as sin is in all of his tracks, he either guests on them or randomly yells in the mix somewhere, Another one! Or... DJ Khaled! Shameless self-promotion! That's how this track opens. If this is the first thing you hear on the end credits of Aladdin, how weird is that? It's gonna age badly! I think that's how the end credits start, because Lindsay Ellis, amongst others, have talked about yeah. it. Yeah. So, yeah. I love Aladdin. I was not excited for the Aladdin remake. I was morbidly curious... Now I just want to shoot it into a cannon, into space. I want to shoot it out of a cannon into a bigger cannon. Into the sun. And then have that cannon be filled with cannons that shoot the cannons themselves Well, you were saying earlier you wanted to shoot, you shoot it off the earth in a cannon. By definition, if you shoot something out of a cannon, you are shooting it off the earth. Just not very far. Gravity, bitch! <laughs> I'll do nicely. Um, we've not got any more news this week, have we? No, I don't think so. So, um, before we hit emails, I just wanted to introduce you to something fun. Oh, okay. Um, you know, we do the email section here on the show, guys, yeah. where we ask you guys to email in, bigdamncontact at gmail.com. Yeah. Or if you tweet us anything really interesting or funny, we'll read it out on the show, at Big Dumb Cast. Um Sometimes opening up your platform to the world, to the public, ain't a great decision. No. As was discovered... I've read some of our emails. CBS, <laughs> CBS's uh, Late Late Show this week. Uh, for those who don't know, the Late Late oh, Show hosted is... Hosted by everyone's favourite person in the world, James Corden. <sighs> everyone's favourite animated film star, voice actor extraordinaire, James Corden. How dare you refer to our son as irritating. <laughs> Send the parents of James Corden an email to Commode and Mayo. <laughs> so you can see where he got his ego from. So the Late Late Show uh, is a show on CBS that goes out after Colbert in the States. And it's currently hosted and has been for the last four or five years by James Corden. A.K.A. the guy we got rid of. Um, it's and ditched into the he... States. And, and then the States. It's so much of his like... earlier stuff. He was so good. Well... Well, History Boys, yes, Stacy. Now, if, if he's acting in stuff, his episodes of Doctor Who, I've always enjoyed him when he's acted in stuff, yeah. Um, and Ruth Jones could not be the sole reason Gavin and Stacy was good, like Corden's scripts or characterization must, although having must have played a part in that. Having seen some of Horn and Corden, I think it's a fair bet she was most of the good stuff. Well, <laughs> Matthew, Matthew Horn and he, um, split apparently after Horn and Corden, not parted ways split oh so it goes to show hang on is he not someone who's good to work with well oh. james corden has for years despite sort of a fairly decent sort of um fan base and people who are like oh yeah i love james corden for years has had rumors following him and stories following him of being a very difficult person to work with bordering on nasty but he's just he's just so you know friendly and charming and jolly well those stories travel through show business to the point where like Stuart lee found out james corn was a big fan so added to his set a whole thing about talking about why he doesn't give a shit about that <laughs> well, it's just something like it's and it apparently comes from the fact... he doesn't understand it, he's just like a dog. Yeah. <laughs> like, he's a dog <laughs> trying to understand common. <laughs> it's just... And it's like, I, I would have James Corden have seen that. Well... Fucking Stuart Lee, man. James Corden and The Late Show uh, underestimated the power of the internet for remembering stories about oh, Corden. Oh, wow. Because The Late Show went on Reddit this week. Oh, yeah. The bastion of sometimes great stuff, sometimes not. It's but a lot hey, better than 4chan. at least it ain't 4 <laughs> They went on this Could week worse. with Could the account Late Late Show CBS. Hey Reddit, 
My name is James Corden, and I'm excited for everyone to watch the Late Late Show Carpool Karaoke Primetime Special tonight at 10, 9 Central oh, on CBS. Oh, fuck off. That is not a sentence. It features... I mean, it is grammatically a sentence, but it's not one that should ever be said or written. <laughs> it features a brand new Carpool Karaoke with Celine Dion, along with my favourite Late Late Show moments from this year and some brand new surprises. Carpool Karaoke is the new... Um... Lip sync battle in that it's a it's a oh, fun oh, it's concept the same thing. that was just <laughs> run into the fucking ground. But much like lip sync battle uh, becoming a show and you know going way too far, um, Carpool Karaoke is noticeably uh, a rip off of two other people's formats. Yep, one of which got in touch with the other to check if it was okay to do a similar format, and then this one didn't. So if you've ever seen Robert, Hacks! If you've ever seen Robert Llewellyn's Carpool. Or Jerry Seinfeld's getting coffee with comedians. Those two things existed and were aware of each other's existence and gave each other a thumbs up. Carpool Karaoke then appeared and pretty much ripped them off. Alongside other items that have been and gone on the Late Late Show with James Corden. Such as one that was a rip off of the Buzzcocks lineup game. For oh. example. Um, and also just anybody who likes good comedy watches the Late Late Show with James Corden and is like... we. We used to have Craig Ferguson doing this, and it was wonderful. Mm. And this is what this show is now. The Late Late Show with James Corden stole Reggie Watts to be a ba- the band leader from Comedy Bang Bang. Reggie Watts is freaking hilarious and ridiculously talented, and is wasted on the Late Late Show with James Corden. Mm. Anyway, here we go. Uh, so they're putting together this special. Right now, I'm seated alongside my best friend and executive producer, Ben Winston, as well as our talent direct- uh, talent executive, Diana Miller, head writer, Lauren Greenberg, segment director, Glenn Clements, field producer, Kate Dowd, and editor, Tom Jarvis. So this is a bunch of them in one of the meeting rooms at oh, Reddit wow. or at CBS or whatever. We're ready to answer your questions. It's not really about... ask me anything. It's ask the team anything. Well. Oh, okay. Please check out the Late Late Show's YouTube channel, blah, blah, blah. Here's the links to everybody. So here's their Twitters and... Because and, obviously you have to put proof, don't you, on Reddit that it's you. Yeah, yeah. So the proofs are there. La, 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 la. Here Show me the receipts. Receipts, fam. Spill the tea. Uh, top voted thing. Remember that time James Corden showed up to a private Writers Guild of America meeting to advocate for a lower pay grade for late night writers? What was that wow! all about? No, he didn't. What the fuck, says Insane Knight. Tell me this is just a rumour. And Beeve replies, it's not. Late night writer Jack Allison called him out for it on Twitter. And you can read about it and see Corden's response here. TLDR. James Corden allegedly showed up to a Writers Guild of America union meeting for late night writers with an executive producer and none of the writing staff. Before hearing out any of the actual late night writers, James was the first to speak when the meeting opened to the floor. At which point he advocated less pay for new writers with the supposed justification being that it was so he could afford to hire writing assistants. James and the producer seem to acknowledge that they showed up and advocated for lesser pay, but insist that they would never pay a writer less than they deserve. But when all is said and done, James advocated for lesser pay for new writers, despite their semantic argument. What's the difference between a writer and a writing assistant? Well, here it is. This is extra extra hilarious because writer's assistants are paid $700 a week on the low end and $1,000 a week on the very high end. And the Writers Guild of America does not represent writer's assistants because they consider that a production role, not a writer's job. So a writing assistant would be sort of the British equivalent of a researcher. So it'd be someone who maybe go over the script, help come up with the segments, yeah, maybe yeah. do the script editing on behalf of the writer, something like that. Even though, so, you know, important work, but not the comedy writer. Um, even though half of all writers in Hollywood were probably writers' assistants at some point in their careers. I imagine, yeah, there's a lot of crossover. Kid Licorice says, hey man, I don't mean to be pedantic, but I've worked on various projects and shows in LA for eight years. Minimum on almost anything is going to be around $150 PA minimum for a 12 hour day in the state of California is $185.50. And that's legally the lowest you can go. That means you're really looking at closer to $750 minimum, but usually it's around 185 to 200 day rate, which is closer to the thousand number quoted. Yes, that is still before taxes. And after taxes, and considering how rent in sky- is skyrocketing in LA, the main hub for this, yeah. this is not great. And James Corden and his producer are objectively pieces of shit for advocating lower wages. <laughs> and being... Yeah, don't advocate lower wages, period. Yeah, and being a writer's assistant sucks because they dangle the carrot of advancement in your face for years without actually having to give you anything. Yeah. I know so many talented people working at the BBC and Children's BBC who are in that same position. Yeah. 
Um, and you have to deal with writers who are notoriously some of the most privileged and unaware pieces of shit in this industry. Not all of them, but some. Lord help you if it's a comedy show, because then at least half of those writers are anxiety-ridden, hyper-competitive stand-ups who are trying to get their shit in and will shit on anyone because that's the only way they know how to communicate with other people. Yep. And you have to get in before all the writers and leave after them. And even if you get a joke or idea or segment in, because people can't deny it's a legitimately good pitch, you're not allowed to take credit for it because you'd be breaking union rules. Wait, what was my point? Oh yeah, being a writer's assistant sucks, but the pay is somewhat marginally better than how you described it. But not much. Um, so, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's the first thumbed up comment, oh, right? Oh, Jesus. The last comment on that is, <coughs> forget the I hear he's a jerk rumours, this is brutal. Yeah. So, these are the other questions, amongst some of my favourites, sent to James Corden and The Late Show during this Reddit AMA. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Have you ever considered being funny or likeable? That's from Deku Silver Soul. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Chester Charity Savage Chester Charity says my brother's girlfriend played one of your videos on my YouTube account now it keeps recommending more of them to me do you know how to get it to stop doing that <laughs> in Pablamations is there any chance of bringing back Craig Ferguson instead oh <laughs> Well, the thing is, though, this guy must be he must be popular because he has an audience because they've not fired him. But he has an audience because memes. Yeah. Like, the same mm. reason Fallon has an audience, because memes. Like, their shows are about creating memes instead of decent content. Ugh. Like, Kimmel is a capable host and a decent monologuer. Sometimes comes across as a bit uninformed and false in, in the interview, but whatever. Conan has stripped away the interviewer persona. To make it more like he wanted it. So his show's now half hour and it's him sat next to the guest in chairs. He's dressed casually and they just chat shit. Yeah. Which is a lot more intense. And he gets to do the weird skits he always liked doing anyway. Yeah. Uh, so the budget is there more for that now. Um, Trevor Noah Daily Show is a different kind of cat and a different animal. But he's entertaining, well informed. And if he doesn't know the ins and outs of his guest's work and life exactly, he makes sure to find out about them in the interview in a way yeah. which like, you're interested in what you're doing. Colbert is very charming, very entertaining, has a good sense of humour and never comes across as false. Do you know what I mean? There are ways to do this. Um, James Corden just comes across like Jimmy Fallon to me, which is just memes, trying yeah. to be memes. This Is is this memes? Seth <laughs> Meyers, memes. again, lovely. Very down to earth in his interview approach. Uh, will challenge guests and call them out if he feels they're being inappropriate or spreading lies. Yeah. Which is really good. Um, Love that. James, says Uncle Herschel. Did you realise you posted on Reddit IMA, uh, I, uh, ah, IAMA instead of roast me? <laughs> um, oh, spicy. Oh, my God. Anything? I love it. Says ORI. Okay. Every time an Ask Reddit post comes up asking about asshole celebrities, your name inevitably comes up. How do you respond to this? And are any of these anecdotes true? Now, what I like about that is they have not just said, you're a dick. They've said, people keep saying you're a dick and spread stories. Is this true? James Corden or his representative or any of the team from CBS, none of them reply. But a new account called James Corden is a dick replies. Oh. Massive cunt in person. I saw a league of their own filming live. That's his Sky yeah, panel show in the UK. Because it's, it's one thing I it's would a question give... of sport, but not funny. Yeah, the which one... is good, which is weird because there are no comedians on a question of sport, <laughs> <laughs> and the league of their own is all comedians. The thing, the thing I'll give him is this: he he is he's he's, he's like a Kardashian or Katie Price. Yeah, he's I just... don't value his output, and I don't think he's adding anything to cultural society. But you can't deny that he works relentlessly. The, the fruits the fruits of his labour aren't entertaining to me and to a lot of the people, but like he works relentlessly. These people work like crazy, or at least work to publicise like crazy. Do you know what I mean? So James Corden will do the Late Late Show, then he'll fly back to the UK for the weekend and do a league of their own when a series that is on. Do you know what I mean? Like that's, that's a lot of work to do. Yeah. I'm sure the money's good as well, but... James Corden is a massive cunt, says James Corden is a dick. I saw a League of Their Own filming live. He threw multiple tantrums over minor things at the production staff, with him being incredibly rude to them, which made the other regulars seem awkward, like this was usual. Between each take, the other celebs would be chatting amongst themselves, bantering about. James was glued to his phone. At the end of the filming, people got up to go get pictures with James, and he massively kicked off, shouting at people to go away and to go back to their seats. The few he did let have a picture with them, he was moody as. 
Afterwards, we went to a VIP tent as such for beer. We were guests of people, anonymity for obvious reasons. And the celebs were going to be joining us. The other celebs came in and spoke with people. James came in for a moment. Someone asked politely for a picture. He said, later. And fucked off to his, I'm assuming, changing room for the rest of the night. But yeah. they didn't get their picture before it was kick-out time. Seeing him like that made me realise everything you see of him on TV is a complete persona. And really, his natural personality is just a self-entitled cunt. Good. Also, Rampart, which people keep bringing up. Because they're all going back to that Woody Harrelson Q&A about Rampart from seven years ago, where it also did not go very well. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, well, yeah. This continued... Uh, someone put, it must be so satisfying for his co-workers to watch him be torn to shreds on here. Uh, someone's put, for fuck's sake, five hours in and they only answered three questions. And someone put, well, I mean, according to the names, he didn't answer any of them. <laughs> um, someone's put, I've heard very similar things from people who have worked with him on movie sets. I used to think it was just one of those things where people may have caught him on a bad day, but it's actually absurd how common these anecdotes are about him and his personality. Old Toby says, the argument he had with Patrick Stewart at that awards show turned out to be uh... because the cunt was on his phone. Whilst giving out awards. Because remember, it, that happened to everyone. Wow, Patrick Stewart's been really short with James Corden. There. Yeah, that seems yeah. a bit harsh. Yeah, I guess we didn't see the shot in between of him on his phone at the podium. Massively disrespectful for several reasons. I can't imagine. I'm, obviously, this is just a perception thing because I don't know Patrick Stewart. But I can't imagine... Her buttons Pat- are the best. <laughs> I can't imagine Patrick Stewart being unnecessarily unpleasant to people. Yeah. Now, especially at this stage of his career, why would he, you know... Some people have talked about, like, maybe James Corden... He should just come out and say, I'm not good with people, I'm an introvert, sorry if I come off like an asshole. Yeah, Will Wheaton's apparently done this on occasion. Uh, but someone points out, Julian Casablancas from The Strokes is a known introvert. Barely meets fans after concerts, when he does he seems awkward. I understand he doesn't like the attention, that's why he tends to fuck right off after the concert is over before everyone tries to meet him at the concert. I've witnessed it myself a few times. But at least he has let people know. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, he's gone, I can't deal with this, I'm sorry. Cool. There's, of course, people bringing up that famous incident where Buster Rhymes was not, just didn't stop for autographs, and he had to turn to that lady and say, Lady, I need to take a shit. <laughs> uh, Val Kilmer apparently has a very similar reputation to James. More stories are coming out. But then, you know, like, after all this abuse, things iron out a little. General Blistercock, great the captain, <laughs> asks, Hi, James. Thank you for doing this Hi, AMA. James. I'm an aspiring comedian. I'm looking for some advice to make it big in the industry. You're a big source of inspiration for me, so it would mean very much if you replied, uh, is it true you are an asshole? (laughs) 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 Ah, like the way you buried the lead on that one. (laughs) Throw away Stern 143. Why do you treat fans like shit, James? (laughs) Why do you treat everyone like shit? Someone put, uh, C of Dinks put, the man treats his own body like a piece of shit. Rental car. Do you expect him to treat others well? Callum247, put it this way, we're not weight shaming, but at the same time, if I were wearing that much Lycra on the regular for skits, which I used to do, I'd, I'd try and trim a little bit, if only just to make the Lycra easier to wear. Yeah. Not even for an image point of view, just I've worn Lycra, I'm with my gut, it's not comfortable. I imagine it would be more comfortable if it was at least in a straight line mm. of some sort. I don't know. Who am I, I kidding? I'll wear like her anytime. I like that day. male camel toe though. <laughs> That's why I wear my pants so high. Callum247. I don't know how to phrase this as a question, so I'll start with, did you know that if you actually acknowledge the claims you're not a nice person and tackle them head on and talk on it from your point of view, it's way better than your PR for your PR than just ignoring them? Yep. Um, oh, good Lord. Oh. Ram- Rampart, Rampart, Rampart keeps coming up. Uh, why won't James answer any of these questions about how big of an asshole he is? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like something an asshole would do. No, no, wait, wait. Are these questions about how big of an asshole he is or how big his asshole is? <laughs> oh, God. Well, <laughs> Doc Juice says, you see, you've got to be more subtle with it. James, as a late night host, who's been your favourite celebrity for finding out why Reddit says you're a huge asshole? <laughs> <in this? laughs> oh, God. Um... I see Posse 8. Hey, just wanted to say thank you for taking the time to do this AMA for the Reddit community. Uh, I really don't know as much about the work you do, uh, and if that's anyone's fault, it's mine. Uh, I don't watch too much television. I mainly stream stuff. Anyways, on to the question. I've recently heard you're an asshole in real life. Any truth to this? (laughs) Hey, James, says Rakust. Big fan. Uh, Well, I'm not really a fan, more a detractor. But I have a couple of questions for you. One, do you have an idea of what comes after death? Do you think the Judeo-Christian ideas of heaven and hell are right? Or do you believe that the only real life after death a person has is the legacy they leave behind? Two, depending on the answer to question one, 
Why do you live your life this way? <laughs> Three. <laughs> I've heard you liken to the comedic equivalent of being castrated with hedge clippers. Oh! Would you agree with this statement? Ooh, it's not funny. Four. It's not very funny. I've heard you like to be... Uh, I've heard you liked the personable equivalent of concrete shoes. Hmm? Would you agree with this statement? Five. Can you recall a time when you were entertaining? Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> Can you recall a time when you were entertaining without someone writing all the lines for you? Took me out. North Shields. How is this attempt at advertising on Reddit going for you so far? Yeah. Um, uh, loving your work, James. Loving, loving your work, work. James. Um, Zelnoth. Are you only going to respond to questions that are directly asking about carpool karaoke? So second rate squash says, do the guests on carpool karaoke think you're as much of a cunt as the general oh, public? That's so good. Oh my god, this is... That. So I'm going to look at... I'm just going to pick a couple more out before we move on to emails. Ah, no uh, D45H. Do you guys feel bad for lifting Robert Llewellyn's format? Uh, Which led into a bunch of people then sharing the links and people going, Oh my god, Crichton did a chat show! And they're all now sharing it, so that's great. Um, how true are the stories that people say James Corden is a huge jerk in person? Loved him on Doctor Who, though, says NYC. Um, <laughs> James. Says, send help very drunk. Are you aware that everyone thinks you're a hack and a talentless asshat? Probably why you're such an asshole. But here's here's the most odd and bizarre one. All right, I can't wait for this. You ready for this? Okay, this is really, really... Oh, hang on, I'll read this one out first. Okay. Ultra Chronic Monster. Ever thought about coming back to the UK? And if so, what can we do to stop you? (laughs) (laughs) Alchemy Arcade says, James, is there any truth to this? Now, this is a story that Pop Bitch posted uh, quite some time ago. Um, Hit me with it. Here we go. And the story. I've heard a story that there was a woman on a plane with a crying baby. Oh, no. And the person who saw her realised the man sitting beside the woman was Corden. Corden didn't seem too perturbed by the baby crying, just put his headphones in and a sleep mask on. The whole trip went by and the woman with the baby stood up and was trying to get her overhead baggage down whilst also holding the still crying baby. Finally, she snapped and hit Corden on the shoulder and said, could you hold our kid for one minute, please? So he apparently ignored his wife and child for an entire flight. What? Now, if James Corden would like to come on the show and and, uh, debunk any of these rumours, that'd be great. Uh, If you'd also like to come on the show and talk about being a giant asshat, that'd be wonderful too. So, there we are. I love it. Beautiful, isn't it? Uh, the story is, kids, don't wow. be an asshole if you have any modicum of success or a platform. Because people will talk about how much of an asshole you are. Yeah. I'm, and I'm you won't be able to do your Reddit AMA. I'm a huge asshole. Only uh, at work. Well, this might heal you slightly. That's why I'm quitting. What, being an asshole? No, I'm, that's why I'm quitting my job. It just makes me a prick. You should quit your job to uh, watch Terminator Dark oh. Fate. Poster's out, and it's welcome to the day after Judgment Day is the tagline, and it's a so picture like sentencing day. <laughs> sentencing <laughs> day, and it's Linda Hamilton walking down a road with a shotgun. It's the most minimal poster it's that, ever. It's that same image of Linda Hamilton that we've been seeing since they started releasing images from this film. Yeah, Linda Hamilton with a shotgun. That is a really boring. I think the trailer's, teaser poster. trailer's coming on Friday, so by the yeah. time this comes out, the trailer will be out. So we'll talk about it next week. But do you know what we can talk about in the meantime? What? Emails! Emails! Now we've got a couple of emails about the Game of Thrones Finale. series. Finale. So, let's give our thoughts on the finale in one sentence each. Matt, go. I have little to no opinion. <laughs> Christopher? I have little to no opinion, because I don't watch it. Hey. But, but, but my wife got up to watch it early and then came back to bed at uh, like six o'clock for half an hour and she went well can't believe I got up early for that shit <laughs> that's exactly how she worded it I was like okay yeah I can hear Lucy saying that keep in mind though Lucy I can hear Lucy, I can hear that in her voice she enjoyed episode five and she didn't mind Daenerys's heel turn because she was like no I, I I sensed it coming I thought it was a bit quick but I was fine with it yeah so it was like okay fair enough she was think... the only thing that annoyed about episode five was she thought Cersei's death was underwhelming the character she was oh it's even uh, we'll get to that yeah um 
So I minor spoilers for Game of Thrones: The Iron Throne. Oh, major spoilers! For major Game spoilers for Game of Thrones: The Iron Throne. The Iron Throne. Um, we'll be getting into it because we've got a couple of emails. Um, but it... I love the theory that Drogon only melted the Iron Throne <sighs> because he saw that Danny had been stabbed and suspected the only <laughs> thing that could have done it was the chair made <laughs> it was of swords. The chair made of knives. <laughs> Spiky things. Um, There's a great article I need to send you about like the I... finale by Collider that's really funny. Ooh, I, I know um... some of. By Collider, that's funny. But no, honestly, it's really fun. Yeah, I also didn't have a problem with episode five, but oh, that much of a problem with episode six because I think it was my thing. It's like I don't have a problem with a lot of what actually happened, but it did feel rushed. Mm. It's not. That, it's not that this stuff came out of nowhere. It just felt rushed. And it's not like they couldn't have turned around. D and D turned around to uh, HBO and be like, "Actually, we want to do two shorter series to round it up yeah but i i have a feeling that the conversation was more like okay so how few episodes can we get this done with so we can go and do star wars yeah because it's been confirmed doesn't it that ryan johnson's trilogy is not the one that's slated yeah. so it's the, it's it's the, the dnd one benny off and weiss one can i just remind everybody that um people start to feel game of thrones fans start to feel that it, it sort of loses its way the seeds of that begin when they run out of the books uh and i'd like to offer my two cents on that uh, Benioff is the writer of X-Men Origins Wolverine. So what the fuck were you expecting? <laughs> Carry on. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just thought I'd bring that up. Just thought I'd remind everybody <laughs> that, that the guy, one half of the driver's seat is occupied by the dude yes. who sewed up Deadpool's mouth. Just want to, you know, character choices. Yeah. Hmm. Tell me about it. Uh, this one comes in from our old mucker Tom. Hi, Monty. Mr. Monty, bring me a dream. <laughs> Dear Chris and Matt, Game of Thrones season eight has regrettably been a huge disappointment for me, but I'm not surprised after season seven. Matt, these questions will be aimed at you. Don't point at anything you don't want to destroy. Uh, Seeing as you've watched Game of Thrones Season 8. But Chris, please feel free to add your thoughts. If you have any. What a bet. He doesn't have any thoughts, I don't have many thoughts. Well spotted. After Episode 3, I completely lost all my investment in the show because when the White Walkers were the thing I was most excited about. They were meant to be this unstoppable army of the dead with the seven seasons of build-up suggesting that all the politics along the way were just petty squabbles and the Iron Throne was irrelevant when compared to this huge threat. But no, they didn't even make it past Winterfell. Not to mention the exhaustive plot armor and the fact that they only killed off two main characters, Jorah and Theon, and the fact that they kept showing other characters getting completely surrounded by whites just to cut away and come back a few minutes later to show them perfectly fine. This happened way too many times and was a betrayal of the realism and brutality I fell in love with in the earlier seasons. And we didn't even see a single one-on-one fight with a White Walker general and a character, something that I was looking forward to a lot. And we didn't get a lick of backstory or lore behind them or the Night King. What was the point of all that build-up? It kind of makes just all those scenes redundant. As a, as a result, whilst it looked very nice and had an amazing soundtrack, I thought The Long Night was the worst episode of Game of Thrones until I watched episode 6. Can you see why a lot of fans were disappointed with how episode 3 handled the White Walkers? Yes, I can see. I was not massively disappointed. I got... Uh, just Had didn't... you been edging, though? Mm, I'm always kind of edging. <laughs> it's the seams, isn't it? They've got very strong muscles down there. Oh, good lord. So I don't need to use my hands. Oh, my God. <laughs> you just tense your thighs. <laughs> and um, strum yourself no, to ecstasy. terrible, terrible, awful, awful. <laughs> um, no, I... I don't know. It... Filthy. Yeah, the White Walkers are... I just didn't really care that much. It didn't really... <laughs> I, didn't, I wasn't really bothered that we didn't get more of them. I was like, okay, well, that part of the plot's over. And that battle was cool. Now let's actually solve all the interpersonal dramas, which is what I was more drawn to. So I guess it depends what you, what it is you're most invested in. And it for me, the part of the show I was most invested in was never the army of the dead stuff. Yeah, I mean, the gauntlet laid down at the end of season one is who's going to get the throne. Yeah. In, in, who's, who's eventually going to get the throne. Yeah. Like, you know that people are conspiring and plotting and that's, you know, that's what's up in the air. 
um, the White Walkers were the looming threat of the show. But they were never going to be the the denouement. Yeah, that's not what the show is about. Yeah. But, yeah, it depends. Like I mean, saying, there might, maybe there was a way to, to layer that story so that both stories intertwined for the six episodes. Different, different parts of that setting... Different parts of the setting capture different people's imaginations in different ways, so... Yeah. Of course, some people come for the more overtly fantasy stuff. Some people come for the more interplan- in- interplanetary, Inter- <laughs> interpersonal conflicts and relationships. Marty! So. Um, it's interdimensional, Marty! Why are you Doc Brown? Wouldn't you be Rick Sanchez? As for episode five, I had a great time watching it, but only because I paid no attention to that disaster of a plot. I am oh, what Danny did was completely out of character. We talking about someone who, a few seasons ago after her dragon killed an innocent child, was shocked and had to lock up her dragons in order to protect her people. The whole point of her story arc was to bring peace to Westeros and destroy the Wheel of Power, but no. After defeating the Lannister army on a whim, instead of solely attacking Cersei and the Red Keep, she decides to become Hitler and mass murder hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians as well, the people who she came to Westeros to save, all because she heard some bells? I don't buy it at all, and I don't think there was substantial enough build-up in the slightest to support this insane decision. Did you buy it? Yes. Question. Because were the bells a sign of surrender? Yes. Um, she doesn't attack because she hears the bells. She attacks in spite of hearing the bells. I saw an argument online that suggested they would have swallowed it. That as a viewer, the person who's writing, they would have swallowed it more. They they sort of felt that it was a bit of a jarring. It felt to them it felt more like shock value that she does that at that moment rather than a character choice. Yeah. But they said what would have possibly altered it it would just be one slight tweak that the bells don't sound like Cersei or whoever refuses to do it and then she takes the step of right and destroys everything the read I got from it was that the bells were too little too late yeah and by that point she just had enough because it is I think it is consistent with the character because yeah she did lock up her dragons after they killed an innocent child and she did want to bring peace to Westeros and break the wheel, as she as she put it, but and but the people she came to Westeros to save, she didn't really come to save them. She came for the throne. Yeah, like she, she's she's liberated people as a byproduct of her overall quest for power. Of, of her quest for power, and it's become she's not the innocent, how she consolidates. She's, not, she's her power. not the innocent young woman we meet in series one. In again. series one, she watches a brother die without blinking. She ties the person who she feels responsible for Drogo's death to his funeral pyre and burns her alive. Mm. She burns down the, um, the house of the undying in Karth and locks. Um, Do you think a lot of it then is people, as viewers, their hero worship of the characters they're fond of is what's yeah. made it feel jarring? Well, and that's something that they address in-universe, in dialogue in episode mm. six. And it's one of the better scenes in episode six. Yes. <laughs> um, but it's... Like season two, yeah, burns down the house of the undying, locks Aaron's over and Daxos and Daria in in a bank vault to to starve to death. Uh when she's fucking around in Marine and Young Kai, she burns a bunch of she burns a bunch of the slavers, the wise masters, she crucifies a bunch of noble men to make an example. Um she uh burns down the uh, uh Vias Dothrak when she takes control of the Dothraki. Uh, she when she comes up back over to Westeros, she uh, burns uh, prisoners who refuse to bend the knee uh, after the battle of um, after the uh, well, it's Blackwater Rush, after the, uh, where she attacks the the, the supply train. Um, she burns Varys at the start of episode five, be, um, for um, admittedly for conspiring to put John on the throne. Um, I, it, you know she's she's a violent she's not a good guy she's a violent and vengeful woman and she be, she's become more violent and more vengeful she's always had that mean streak it's taken a lot of her worst impulses was from her being talked down by Tyrion by Varys by Sajora Sajora's dead Varys betrays her and Tyrion keeps fucking up so there's no one really to put a leash on her, she might possibly have listened to John if John had the spine to stand up to her. Mm. But he was too busy concentrating on his two facial expressions. Yeah. 
So I, I, I didn't feel like it did come out of nowhere. Rushed. But that has been in it, that bloodlust and that vengeance has been an element of her character since day one. She was never going to break the wheel or the cycle or whatever it was. She was never yeah. going to do that because she was, she was always destined to be a mad Targaryen. <laughs> Wasn't she? She was always destined to be. I don't know if it's a destiny thing, but I think it's just. Oh no, no, no just in terms of the narrative. Because of, I don't think like, that it she was inevitable yeah. that, that she was going to go that way. Because I don't think the show is arguing that she was born that way. Oh no, no, I but, feel but, like but the I mean, show. Like, yeah, it, you know, she like we 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 only hear of what the Targaryen dynasty was like. Yeah, like here we get to witness what happens when someone from that bloodline, from that heritage, is given that level of power and what it means. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. She was always going to be our example of what came before them. I say this as I say this is someone who's had a crash course, but like, just to me, that makes the most sense in terms yeah. of it's the sins of the father. Yes. Um, Again, th- this is a, this is a, a, an idea that's addressed in universe in the show in yeah. dialogue. Yeah. Um, and I feel like, like if if the, if there was an opposing, my takeaway, a, 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 a concurrent Targaryen character in it. Danny may have then been the one who broke the cycle and was like, no, and was, was, well, there is, was for, for lack of a better word, a le- lack of a less simplistic word, a hero. But there is, it's John. Yeah. No, well, that, but, but he, he's the good guy, Targaryen, yeah. and not her. And I think that's what people were annoyed at because they were like, because that's the thing, the fandom for this, everyone was like, Cersei, yes, queen. It's like, she's a villain. Oh, no, 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 but she's my favourite. It's like, cool. Don't be unhappy yeah. if she if something horrible happens to her. And, and I, or I, don't be happy if she does horrible things to other people. I absolutely get the criticism. It's a, it's a, the, it's a series about grey areas, but everyone's grey area is murky as people, fuck. People held up Daenerys as a feminist icon of a woman who gained power and then were upset because then she turned into a villain. But yeah. I don't think... It was never a commentary on her, on her sex. I don't or, think on the her, show... On her standing as a feminine icon, a feminist icon. It's the the character. I get that people is, is not a good person ultimately. Yeah, well, even the, even well, the way that they explain it in episode six, the way Tyrion talks about it is, she has spent her entire life in power, being told that she is destined to free people, that she's always right, mm. that what she does and decides to do is the right thing to do, and the best thing to do. And then she, when she's confronted with the possibility that, that might not be the truth, she just doubles down and goes harder because she's goes been, because she keeps getting told that she always makes the right decision. She's always right. It's like you were meant she for this always, and yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. Um. So I think they kind of do address it, but I don't. I I was down with it. Um. As for episode six. I have no words. <laughs> Were you satisfied with the ending of Game of Thrones? As a result, I was sadly left with no option but to sign a certain very popular petition about incompetence. Dude, no! Are you aware of this petition? What are your thoughts on the overall backlash? Um, You did have another option. You could have not signed the petition. I, I, I get what people are saying, but like straight up. The as show, audience members, the show isn't ours as an audience. Yes, yeah, as it audience members, we are not entitled to a do-over if it doesn't go the way things we want. That's not something that we are entitled to demand. Mm. I mean, I get it if you're like, just using it as a place to vent your frustration and yeah. and and say to other people, "You're not alone." I also did not enjoy the writing. Yeah, like fair enough, but please don't anyone signing that petition expect it to change anything because a that's a very slippery slope if that's the thing. Look at the Sonic movie. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, granted, that Sonic movie looks dog shit. But now well, hundreds of people are like, about to have underpaid yeah. overtime to try and repair something. It's done. You just have to deal with it. Like you don't yeah. have, you don't get, you don't get a do over. It it was what it was, and it didn't turn out well, and that sucks. You know, it like, really sucks. Think, but, of, think of another show that you absolutely love that you sort of were dissatisfied with the direction of it and where it went. The X Files. Yeah. Would you make them change it? Fuck no. Oh. You just don't watch the ones you don't care Fuck about, no, and you watch well. you rewatch the ones you like. I fucking love the X Files. And if you want to marry the that... stuff and watch the good and the bad, you do it. I know love that it. like two thirds of the episodes from season seven onwards are absolute guff, if not more. The college like, year of Buffy one... is rather underwhelming, with a few exceptions. 
I would not be like, right, go back and remake that season so yeah. I can have a better time. There is one, one really good episode of the X Files past season nine. Is it the one that's like slightly wackier in its approach? Is, the, is it a werewolf one or something the, like that? Wilderness Gully Meet the Were Monster is the one we reached Darby in, yeah. in season ten. Yeah. That is legitimately a great episode, and it's the only one after season eight. Mm. I think. Um, it's, but a, it's a slippery slope. The show, I, the I as an audience member, is, I am yeah. not entitled to a redo. It's not how it works. Like, now, I, now, I wouldn't go to... If you were funding some, it, I'd someone, argue, if you were funding it, for example, if it was a crowdfunded project, and overwhelmingly everybody involved in it then went, I'm sorry, but the way you concluded that, none of us agree with it. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's up to the creator to then decide whether or not they do redo it, but then you'd have an entitlement to it. Because it's like, don't I have... put my money in this, can I at least get something I feel was worth it as a narrative you journey? Do, you don't have the right as an audience member to demand a redo, because you're not paying for them to create something. Yeah. You're paying to consume the content that they have created, and if you enjoy that, then great. If you don't, sorry. Like, Unfortunately, this does mean that we can never say that, you know, we'd accept the, the, the writer to do a redo on X-Men Origins Wolverine. But yeah, well... That's fine. It exists. Like, here's the thing, and this we'll is... We'll deal with it. This is a sentiment I saw on Twitter when this in this position started going around. You do know that Kathy Bates in Misery is the bad guy, right? <laughs> That's a great comparison. Like, you do know that that whole thing where she tied... Uh, James Khan to a bed and broke his fucking ankles with a sledgehammer until he rewrote the novel the way she wanted it. That's that's a villainous act. Because <laughs> what people are doing with these petitions is essentially is essentially the internet version of that with less sledgehammers and more it, e-petitions. It also delegitimizes serious petitions and causes on yeah. those sites because it makes it seem like it's more trivial. It's like, um, it's like the like the petition to not have Robert Pattinson cast as Batman. It's like fucking really, like really. Is he a sex offender? Is he a fucking abuser? Not, not that we know of. And no stories have never come out of Robert, about Robert Pattinson. I don't think any. I've not really heard anything. People have anything bad to say about him. The only reason that you don't want him to play Batman is because you're precious about this character like one of um, my favourite websites back in the day just before I forget randomly um, Slight Deviation was there was a Tumblr that was a collection of gifts or clips from Twilight interviews that showed Robert Pattinson clearly thought it was the dumbest fucking story ever but told. Like, even if he didn't, even if he was fully invested in it, like hmm. oh yeah, I don't know. But fine. I mean, in that in that instance, I, I just randomly remembered, like oh yeah, he he used to very openly like the Game of Thrones season eight cast have been doing throw oh, shade yeah. at the product product in the thing. Have oh, you yeah. have you seen any of the cast members talk about it as a definitive positive? Because I think it is a case of if you have nothing nice to say. So many of them haven't commented on it besides, it's been a great journey to be on. Thank you so much for the support, everybody, over the years. Um, Sophie seen... Turner's fought against the petition, I think quite rightly so. Yeah, because it is disrespectful. Like It's just like, mm. oh, you didn't do what we wanted, now do it all again. It's like, that was, regardless of how it turned out, that was a lot of fucking work. And people are like, oh, well, it's not the cast and crew, it's just Benioff and Weiss. It doesn't matter. Mm. It doesn't matter. You can have your problems with it, but don't say, I want it different. You like you it, can't. don't like but it, like I say, don't throw your toys out the problem and like start demanding a do-over. Do you know what you should do? And I said, We said this when the Last Jedi petition was going around. What you should do is, uh, this isn't directed, dire- none, none of everything yeah. we've just said is directed directly at you, Tom. This is just like an open discussion. Um, but what I think people should do if you have the time and the energy to get together to try and crowdsource a remake of a blockbuster or to all rally together against not liking a thing original project make a new thing like make something new not derivative of that or a sequel to it or i mean (laughs) hell even fanfic like fanfic yeah like write a fanfic hang on that's what people used to fucking do before they started before day. petition before sites. petitions. They people just wrote used fan, to write fiction. fan fiction. Um, before, you know, before Tumblr got rid of your boobies, so you can't, all, write, they can't write the fan fiction for Game of Thrones. I've on always Tumblr. been sort of unfairly dismissive of fan fiction, I think. Uh, it's a great but, way to cut your teeth. Yeah, and but it's, practice. you know, it is what it is. Um, but was I satisfied? I was more 
mostly it's not it's not that I wasn't satisfied by the way things ended. I was sa- I was not satisfied by how quickly we got there. Yeah. It, it feels like um George R. R. Martin said to them, Here's where this guy ends up, here's where this lady ends up, here's where they end up, here's where they end up, here's where they end up. And um D and D have gone Oh brilliant. Mm, but we've set ourselves a very short deadline. Let's just let's do just it get to that away. point instead of picking a point near that conclusion and then leaving it open to continue should they wish to one day and tell that final stretch of the story. Or just say to HBO, Hi, can we do two six episode seasons, please? I'm sure I HBO say, would have said I... Yeah. I mean John Oliver's been joking on last last week tonight, these last few weeks, which goes out on HBO after Game of Thrones. Yeah. Um in a few weeks' time, this network is fucked. Yeah. Like, he just keeps saying it over and over again that, like, they'll have nothing. They'll have no... Goodbye to anyone watching now, because we know you're only watching because you've hung around. Goodbye, everyone. This yeah. network is fucked. Um, I think... So yeah. I, yeah, for me, it's, it wasn't where it, it wasn't where it ended up. It was the execution. Hmm. Um, and, like, because of choices they'd made leading up to the ending to not flesh out certain aspects of certain characters and the narrative as a whole it some of it just felt a little oh that's odd when you think about it it kind of makes sense Mm. it's just just didn't how they got there didn't quite line up um but i didn't i wasn't yeah satisfied with the ending not satisfied with the execution of it um Tom says, I guess the only positive I can take out of season eight is that I now have a great inclination to read Jorah R. R. Martin's fi- A Song of Ice and Fire to find out the true ending if he ever finishes them. Do you have any interest in these books? I've read uh, the published Song of Ice and Fire books and I am awaiting the last two with bated breath. Um, if Again, if they ever uh, come out. But um, the, I have been of the uh, opinion, only half jokingly, before that, the part of the reason why the last two books haven't come out is because George has written himself into a corner and can't quite <laughs> work out how to get out of it. Um, and it's interesting <clears throat> watching the show and how they tied it up as to what major plot lines and characters and sets of characters even from the book are just completely ignored or excised or merged with other characters and plot lines so it's like oh reading the books i don't think this is going to be very important come the end of it but i don't know how different the endings are going to be um it is you know a song of ice and fire's ending is only the true ending for a song of ice and fire it can't be the true ending for game of thrones Thrones. because they uh, are fundamentally different beasts Due some to the nature of adaptation. Still around, some aren't. Yeah, like, yeah. It's he's got two more books of describing food to oh, go. So much food. Although it is winter, so it'll all be stews. Maybe the odd roast. So we'll be see- we're seeing a lot of the word broil, broil, and glazed, a good bowl of brown. Yeah, bra- like bra- that brazen. Brazen. A lot in the books. Brazen. Brazen. Ooh. Mm. Um. <laughs> Apologies for all the negativity, but Game of Thrones was at one point my favourite TV show and I was hurt to see it be resolved in such a way. It sucks, man. It sucks to see a show you love go down the pan. That's how I was feeling about the uh, Doctor Who prior to season 11. Mm. Um, that's how I felt about The X-Files <laughs> after its revival seasons. But uh, The beauty of it is you, you know, now know the journey and you know yeah. the eventual destination. So one day you will revisit it, the the whole thing. <laughs> And you'll be braced. You'll yeah. be braced, and you'll 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 find things in it that right now you're not spotting. Yeah. You'll find things in it that you do enjoy, and you know, you still enjoyed the stuff you enjoyed. Yeah, they can't take that away from you. Yeah, that's true. I think that's the thing people forget. Like, but, like but when when something sticks the land in it, is it, yeah. it can make you go, oh god, it's ruined forever in but a way. The, but you the, know, it's what, the when you thing look of back like, at it, you go, oh yeah, no, this is why I love it. Look yeah. at all these things that I enjoyed. And like people go, oh no, when you know something new comes out that, and they're like, oh no, my childhood's ruined. It's like your childhood isn't ruined. Your childhood was your childhood. Like 
Kingdom of the Crystal Skull didn't ruin anyone's memories of Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's not how. That's not how time works. That's not how memories work. That's not how we um, use time. And Raiders of the Lost Ark's a great movie, so fuck Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Um, also, apologies for the magnitude of this email, but after listening to four hours <laughs> of my friend the whole of Game of Thrones to Chris, I think it's only right. It was a great episode, by the way, and congrats on 150. Thanks Thank you very much. much. Uh, please do not apologize for the magnitude of your emails. We love we love getting into it on on stuff like Game of, on stuff like Game of Thrones. It's such a big show and a big cultural phenomenon. I think we absolutely need to, you know, chew over it um, because it's worth chewing over. We were alive for it by yeah. Jiminy. Yeah. Uh, this one comes in from Beth um, Hi. on Instagram as Beth. At, as at Flip Endo Films. Hey, um, Beth Brill. She's a big film fan. Check out Flipendo Films on Instagram, folks. There we go. She collects really cool rare steel books. Um, hi. <laughs> true fact. It's true fact for you. Hi, Matt and Chris. What did I think to the finale of Game of Thrones? In one word, I was underwhelmed. 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 Um, past seasons finales have always left me absolutely buzzing. Viserion becoming an ice dragon. Ned Stark's beheading, etc., etc. Maybe it's because this is the final season that there was no need for an ending such as these. However, the time of endings just seemed... Meh. <laughs> um, with Danny's death scene, I absolutely loved how Drogon obliterated the Iron Throne. I thought that was actually quite beautiful. Eight seasons of hatred, death and conflict over the Game of Thrones that was started by a Targaryen has now been ended by a Targaryen. As for Danny, her death was too quick. It was presented more like a mercy killing when it should have been murder. Her merciful death made her out to be an innocent character. A tiny trickle of blood and no last words. Not even John before she died. <laughs> Pathetic. Robin Catelyn Stark received a more brutal ending than Daenerys. I think it would have been... Mm, yeah, I think if it were a really brutal death might have come off as cruel. Maybe. Yeah. Because it also, John was really reluctant. And I think if left, if Tyrion hadn't have influenced him, John would have... John would have tried to sort of ride it out and maybe steer her back to something resembling a bit more sanity. John was always looking for the best in her. Yeah. But I don't, I think the people who had known her longer were like, oh no, she's she can't come back from this. And, and you know, should she be able to, like, she destroyed a city, killed Yeah, that character did not have a redeeming arc. Thousands of innocent people. Children! Burned in the streets in their arms of their mothers, like Jesus. Um, I think it would have liked to have been Grey Worm to kill her rather than John. As soon as John found out his parentage, he's been distant toward Danny, and it's been obvious that he was losing faith. Yeah, uh, Grey Worm must have been her side no matter what, especially after Miss Ande's death. I feel it would have been more satisfying for her commander of armies and one of many liberated slaves to lose faith in her and then full on yeet a javelin <laughs> through her heart from miles off. <laughs> That would have been a twist that no that one That bitch empty! You <laughs> Just lob it. That would be wonderful. I mean, I, it's... If it just became a vine, in its last six seconds, the uh, show becomes a vine. I mean, I, I... I... I definitely bought into more Grey Worm just being all the way with her. Because... The thing with, with Daenerys that I f- felt towards the end of the, the series uh, is that she wasn't... She wasn't born a monster. She was made into it. Like, all the stuff that helped her become a, a great liberator and leader and ruler is also the stuff that made her hungry for revenge and conquest. And it's like, when she's going and talking about liberating the rest of the world, the known mm. world, it's like, you're not liberating, you're conquering. You you're just that. replacing one rule with another rule. It's not... You're not bringing freedom. You're just bringing a different kind of servitude and I think that was what was that was what that was why the whole Danny thing worked for me Mm. and why I think it didn't work for some other people is because I just it never felt as if she even as far back as when she was taking over Yunkai and Marine and and, and all that seasons four and five it never felt like she was being a merciful liberator it always felt like she was just becoming another tyrant. Mm. Although one with a nicer face, so to speak. Yeah. Um, uh, as for Bran the Broken, I am so down with it. Aside from the utter cringe of Edmure Tully, which 
I don't know what happened. That was kind of great. Um, that whole scene was brilliant. Once I realised that this was days later when the Starks hadn't just teleported to King's Landing. The whole talk of democracy in the future kings and queens will now be chosen by the lords and ladies of Westeros was perfect. And I believe each of the Starks ended up in their rightful place. Sansa was Lady of Winterfell. Um, all she ever wanted to be was a lady and she fought to take back her home from Ramsay. Arya going travelling. She always wanted to be a knight but with no war to fight for now. She can see the rest of the world now that she's already been east. And Bran? Well, why do you think he came all this way? Um... Oh, Santa doesn't just become Lady of Winterfell. She becomes Queen of the Queen North. Of the North. Queen of the North. Um, as for... Queen of the North! Yeah, the Edmore Tully cr- cringe bit was just so great. It was just like... Because he's been absent for like four fucking seasons. He's been in prison for most of... Um, for most of the fucking war. <laughs> and then he's like, uh, well, I... I and we're just like, nah. Sit down. <laughs> Sit down, Sit down, bitch. bitch. <laughs> it was very good. <laughs> Tobias Menzies played it perfectly. Like, it's so it was so embarrassing, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Kanisha had a real bug in being a bonnet about the idea of Sansa it, wanting to install Bran as king and then declaring the North independent because he's still a Stark. So the Starks, the king of the six kingdoms, and the North's also independent. Yeah, but I'm like, well. He, Divide the kingdoms up and give it all to the Stark kids. The, th- the thing is, like, he is a Stark in name only now. He's not really Bran anymore. Isn't he? He's, I would have had no idea. Yeah. He's, it's not like he's ever it's not gone like he on keeps about fucking it. fucking talking about it. He's Bran in name only. And, he, and as Sansa was very quick to remind everyone, he can't bear children. So... This has to be an electric, guys, because <laughs> so he ain't got no food in his but fruit I, pouch. That's what they want to avoid. They don't, what they would have got with Daenerys is they would have, it would have been starting another dynasty. Yeah. And it doesn't... To be fair, in historically, all elected monarchies, which is they weren't going to a democracy because Sam suggests it and they just turn the piss out of him because, of course, it's, it's too big a leap mm. to go from a feudal system to straight up democracy. <laughs> it's like, uh, no... And one of the guys is like, I'll just ask my horse. Um, <laughs> and, and like, sure, whatever. Um, but in historically, all elected monarchies have eventually led to the reinstitution of uh, din- um, eh, dynastic monarchy, uh, such as the Holy Roman Empire, etc. Et so, you know, it could still go south, but it's a chance to do something um, better. And really, it's not a monarchy because Bran's just a figurehead. It's the small council led by Tyrion that are actually going to fix everything. Mm -hmm. Which is why Bran names Tyrion as his hand as punishment for everything he's done wrong. Because he... I don't know if Delucia told you this, but he says Mm -hmm. he he made all these mistakes and caused all these problems and now as punishment he's going to spend the rest of his life fixing it all. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really the council that's doing all the administration. Brand's just sitting there going, he's sitting, oh, I'm, um, the I'm the three eyed raven. Oh my god, I just, I just, I just walked into a, I just walked into a mouse um, and I nearly got, I nearly got some cheese. Are you going travelling? Was one of those things that would have made a bit, would have felt a bit more right if they'd have spent a bit more time being like, this is something she wants to do. Yeah. Um. Because she has always been adventurous, but she's been more adventurous in a in a fighting. I want to be a knight. I want to fight sort of way. I want to be a warrior. I want to wear um, people's faces and feed them their own relatives. Yeah. <laughs> Again, the complaint coming up that, um, oh well, she only ever got to use a faceless man stuff once. It's like, well, that's all she needed to use. Right. <laughs> once that we saw, like she she did murder all of the phrase. Like, oh yeah, she didn't, she, 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 she snuck up on the fucking Night King. Almost. That seemed underwhelming to me as an outsider, that the actual, his actual death just came from one shanking in the ribs. Yes, yeah, because, the, but it's, they've established that Dragonglass and Valyrian Steel can do that to White Walkers. Okay. Like, you stab them with even, it, Even so, it just sort of, as, 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 as that kind of rising threat, it just feels so, it feels very brief. Yeah, I guess. The fact but that it all kind of happens one of those, in Lett. As, as but he doesn't speak though, does he? No. So you weren't really going to get any interesting no, like, scenes what, with what him. What drama you were going to get out of the, this mute enemy who just kills 
people and brings them back as whites. Like, as whites. Like, <laughs> if if he, if he remains unbeatable for too long, then he just becomes unbeatable and you can't win. Yeah. And there's no way you can satisfact to satisfactory close that narrative without everyone just being dead and it being real bleak. And I don't think that's ever what the show was going for. The show's going for bleakness, but it's not mm. going for absolutely. It's not, an abs- it's not a huge downer ending. Like there has to be some. You know, the hobbits need to go into the west, just like Aya. Um, uh, John's ending was also perfect. My boyfriend didn't agree as he wanted to see John on the Iron Throne, but John ending where he started his entire journey in this series was great. And we presume that he goes to join the Free Folk in the far north with Tom and Ghost and the Wildlings. I hope that's true. He found true love with the Wildling and that's where his heart has always been. Yeah, that's what I read that as. Mm-hmm. Like, they send him back to the Night's Watch, but really what they're doing is they're sending him back to the wall and he's just going to fuck off up north with Tom and... Yeah, because Tormund's waiting for him. So like, hello, Tormund should have already gone back north by the wall. So there he goes with the wildlings. Do you fancy role play? The only problem is that do you want Tormund, to be a giant woman. He sees Tormund, but Tormund doesn't say anything. Ah. So he gets to see Tormund, but he doesn't have any lines. Ah. And Tormund's great. Yeah. Do you think he will dress John up as a giant teat? That'll probably take turns. <laughs> Got to stay warm north of the wall. Walking's good. Fighting's better. Fucking's best. <laughs> um. Uh, so yeah, I I I definitely read the um the idea of him just fucking off and joining the wildlings up north. It was good. With all these endings, felt satisfying to me. The whole tone of the episode just felt average. Even Danny's speech to her remaining men didn't grip me. Blah blah blah, liberating people. Blah blah blah, fight for me. Blah blah blah, I'm your queen. I felt that was kind of the point though. Like as a, as as someone who's reasonably like moderately minded, being like, oh god, she's gone over the edge here. Yeah, I so suppose. it's like yeah. it just comes across. She's as, villain monologue, as, as rhetoric. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, next, the short scene with the King Council was just cringe. Please never let me see that again. <laughs> Bran was there for two seconds and then did his whole "I'm going to go now." It made them crack on without him. And speaking to your third person, don't get me started. That is Bran, though, isn't it? Because <laughs> again, if they'd have actually done more to set up what the Three Eyed Raven actually does slash is, mm-hmm. it probably would have worked for me a little better. But it's just. The three eyed raven. King, see the future. You're king now. Yeah. <laughs> just like. And, no, it wasn't even that. Though, wasn't it wasn't the, the argument. Wasn't the like... argument. His story is the most sort of. Yeah. Thing, so he He's... should be king. It's like. He knows. But the, I'm well, sorry. Would you, do you want to talk to his sister Tyrion. about how she was like abused for years, then fed her abuser to some dogs and kicked ass? Do you want to talk about his well, other sister who Tyrion's... becomes a face swapping assassin? Uh, like traveling the freaking known world. Tyrion's argument is that he can, he knows the past, he knows the stories of the whole race. Yeah. Of the whole, the, you know, the real realm as a whole. But nobody, nobody asks him to tell you the stories because it'll take he won't four do. hours. Yeah. But yeah, he's, I was like, because all they've done is like, he can look back in time and also I guess he can see the future so he knew this was going to happen anyway. That's why and he's then, done sod all. Well, he says that because he's he like, like oh, "I'm going to eventually be king anyway." They ask him, they ask him if, if, if if he'll be king, and he's like, "Why do you think I came all this way?" What the hell? And he's like, "Well, well, you didn't. You, Other people got yeah, you. Yeah, they pushed you in um, <laughs> in a chair, sitting in a sled, little fuck." Um, <laughs> but, uh, it, if they'd actually gone into more what it's like <laughs> being the Three Eyed Raven now than in just having Bran go, "I'm not Bran Stark anymore." I'm the three-eyed raven. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that entail? What does it? Um, what powers has it bequeathed I mean, upon like, you? I feel, I feel like what it's the execution that failed. If they'd have given it another season, the end of this season had been the long night and defeating the White Walkers. People would have been more satisfied with that because you get more White Walkers. And then the next season is defeating Cersei, Daenerys's um, turn to the dark side, so to speak. And then her death and the reformation of the six kingdoms. Mm-hmm. Um, also, it's, probably, it's definitely going to be the five kingdoms soon because Dawn are going to go, uh, if the North are independent, then I guess we're going to be independent too because we basically already are. So, uh, fuck you guys. Laters, taters. I mean, everyone forgot about Dawn anyway. So, <laughs> um, uh, yes, it's, And yeah, and the, the small council scene was mostly all right. The, the bit that cringe was the... it's. The it's this is the history Master Rebros wrote of the war. It's called a Song of Ice and Fire. God, that was not like, a line of dialogue. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. jog on. No, they're like Master Rebros wrote a, a history of everything that happened after King Robert's death, 
Uh, I came up with the title. This is Sam, who's now the Grand Maester of, uh, oh, of King's God. Landing. Oh, God. Um, oh, no. They, but, pull, they pull a Tolkien. But they make it clear that it's not the books that we are reading because Tyrion's fucking Tyrion. He's like, oh, I bet I come off for some heavy criticism. Sam's like, no, 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 no. Oh, he's, he's nice about me. N- no, you, you, you're not in it. <laughs> you're not mentioned. Okay. <laughs> it's like, uh, oh, okay. So, so yeah. instead, instead, it's more a cheeky nod yeah, to, as the, to, to the book series. This the show is, as opposed is to like on. the straight up Tolkien, the Red Book of Westmarch is the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. Like, <laughs> sure, okay. Um, all in all, an average ending to a massive worldwide phenomenon. But the one thing I want to know is what happened to the Dothraki when they found out Danny was dead. Obviously, Grey Worm was not happy, but any Dothraki man would have probably killed John in a second when they discovered that the blood of their blood and Queen had been killed. Sorry this is so long, but I hope you enjoy the read. There's so much I can say about this episode and the season in general. Cheers, guys. Beth. Thanks, um, Beth. Again, at Flip Endo Films on uh, Instagram. Flip Endo um, Films. Thank you. But yeah, I, oh, yeah, we are more than happy to get into Game of Thrones because it's this huge thing. It's such a huge thing. Um... Yeah, that was that was the weird. That was the bit of the episode that felt most rushed and weird. Was the fact that they go from John watching Dragon fly into the sunset to then he's in prison and they're having a like a meeting to decide who the next king should be and what they should do about him. And you don't see any of how he was discovered. Did he confess? Did, did they try and kill him? Did How was he taken into custody? So it's, it's like uh-uh. Benioff and Weiss just couldn't work out what to do, so they just didn't do it. No, you all missed, you all missed a detail. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... You all missed a detail. Earlier in the episode, uh, they mentioned that uh, the majority of the Unsullied and the Dothraki were all hit by a horrible disease called <laughs> Rapid the Fuckabitis. <laughs> which, which makes you disappear at convenient moments yeah. so as to save time it's and like... streamline your finale. It just they just couldn't. They were like, "Oh, we're gonna wrap this up. We'll just skip over that, and people will fill in the blanks." It's like, no, that's a big ass blank. Job. It's what I mean. Like, how where they end up, I don't have a problem with, but it's just how they get there is just. There's this could have been a ten episode season, yeah, or two six episode seasons. Like it was just rushed. If they'd have taken their time to get there, it would have worked. I think people would have dug it. Because the actual story itself isn't bad. It's just the way that it's told. Mm. For me, that's, 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 how, yeah. that's how I feel. Um, that's why it's irked folk. Yes. That's why it's irked them. Not necessarily because of the character choices, but because of the way they were told. And finally, um, this one uh, is not a Game of Thrones related email. What? But it comes in from James. James and he says Prince Ali or something. He says, Shall we play the tenth number? No. <laughs> he says, Hello Chris no, and Matt. No, you creepy bastard. No. Hello, Chris and Matt. Hi Six. James. I really oh. like thank you both. <laughs> Some time ago you spoke about the play Ghost Stories. I think this was when the trailer for the film was released. Unfortunately I missed the film cinema release seventy nine, but I did watch it <gasps> immediately when I found oh. out it had arrived on Netflix. This was a great error, as on Saturday the 18th of May this very year, I went to see play the, the play Ghost Stories at the Lyric Hammersmith on the last night of its run. Yeah. Now don't, 19, worry, as we asked, we, we will be keeping the secrets of Ghost Stories here. Hey. But I really wish I hadn't seen the film first, because scary as it was, due to the astounding set design, puppeteering, lighting, sound, and performances, I still knew what was coming. That didn't stop me having a great time, 11. I just feel as if I hadn't seen the film... First, I may have wet myself, 92. I love this play. I love it so much that I bought a copy of the script from Forbidden Planet, signed by those scary man Jeremy Twente, Dyson, and Andy Nyman. Yeah, they released Unfortunately, it, yeah. there was a downside to my viewing of ghost stories, and maybe I'm just being a downer. But we all know cinema etiquette. No talking, no phones, that kind of shit. Surely, it must be the exact same in the theatre. This was not 48. The case when I went to see ghost stories. Sure, you were allowed to scream, but straight up trying to have a conversation with the actors... Why? Oh, God. I know it's tempting, but these people should have not be having conversations with the people they've come to the theatre with. Sorry to rant here, one, but I really needed to get that out of my system. I really love the play and film, although I personally think the play was slightly better, and I thank you both for bringing ghost stories to my attention. Hope you both have a great week and that you're 32. Dreams are sweet. From James. Or am I? 
Ghost Stories is great. Yeah, it I'm is glad James. you have seen the show. And the, I hope your dreams are sweet is a really fucking sinister button to end that yeah, email. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for that. Uh, um, yay! I'm, I'm delighted that our podcast sowed that seed for you. I, I'm really happy about that. Because back when we did our Ghost Stories episode, I remember saying like, we, we sort of have spoiler, avoided spoilers as much as past, didn't we, and everything for the movie. We, yeah. just, we were like, look, if anything, if we get anything out of this, we hope it's just a curiosity to go and check out the film or see the play if it resurfaces. And you went to see it. And it, it, it's, yeah. it's short revival. And you, know, you bought the script book and you've had the film. You've digested three versions of it. And it sounds like you've enjoyed them enough that you've memorized the freaking numbers. Yeah. Um, was there a tenth one? Actually, no. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't, don't, don't go looking. If you included a tenth one, it'll shatter the illusion. The mind sees what it wants to see. Um, I love those stories so much. And, and I really do hope that this brief revival isn't the last we see of it on stage. And it, but it is one of those, it, like, it works so well on stage because that's what it was crafted to do. Mm-hmm. The, I wonder if people were shouting out, because the, the, the framework is obviously a good lecture, I wonder if people yeah. thought it was you know, an improv thing. Like, it's not the Rocky Horror motherfuckers. Yeah. <laughs> but like, um, yeah, stage is where it is thingy. Yeah. Is where it's created for that Jeremy but and Andy still... bring their, their horror movie fandom and their roots in in their love of horror to the movie adaptation it, to make it different enough but it, it absolutely is you know a, a work designed for stage but it's not so tied to the theatrical format that it can't be transferred over to film which look at something in terms of like horror plays you look at something like the stage version of the woman in black mm. that is so mm. steeped in the in the theatrical conceit yeah. And the idea of it being a stage play and not hiding that fact that to do you wouldn't be able to do that script on film. Really. Oh yeah, absolutely. There's two film versions of The Woman in Black as well. Neither the, the ITV Yeah, the great. ITV film, which is People remember it for one shocking, scary visual yeah. moment. That's why people remember it. Yeah. It's dated and a bit stodgy. And the 2014? I want to say it's earlier than that. 2012, maybe? Uh, maybe. The Hammer Horror um, Woman in Black with uh, Daniel Radcliffe. Daniel Radcliffe. Which got a sequel. Uh, which I've not bothered with. I think Lucy said she watched it. It was just... It was exactly what you'd imagine it to be. It was Hammer trying to sort of do Blumhouse sequel territory and it just doesn't work. Yeah. And it also tries to go too much into the backstory of... Of it all, and it's like leave it alone. The, 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 the but, um, Radcliffe one is fine. It it's, is, a, it's a it's a fun yeah. horror movie, and and it's got some really spooky visuals and pacing. I think the pacing of it is excellent, but it's mostly unremarkable. Yeah, in comparison to a uh, wanker sentence, here it comes. Three, two, one. The original book, which is great, and the superior version, which is the stage one. The stage version is fantastic. Um, fantastic that sort of exists solely on stage whereas Ghost Stories I think has like you say it has that ability to translate yeah more but they they split the difference nicely because they didn't they didn't lean into the, the, the into the theatrical conceit so completely that yeah. they would have to re- like of course they retool the script but they don't need to overhaul it completely mm. like the the segments the way that the episodic segments work and the way that the framework of yeah um the lectures works can still fit into a filmic format mm. um it would even work it it work pretty well as like a like a three part mini series or something that could take that, mm, it would that be could excellent work. it would be excellent actually as um, a mini series like a tv thing uh the only downside i think to the short theatrical run that it just had is that one of the wonderful sort of um gimmicks of, of its longer runs before was that it knew people would come back for return yeah so they viewings. rotated certain elements out. Certain, yeah. yeah certain things were rotated and tweaked like certain visual effects and and certain sound and lighting cues were altered slightly from time to time just give it a fresh lick of paint so to speak yeah because i saw it three times in the same run and the uh I won't give it. I won't say where it is or what it's about, but I will. I will just give you a clue with the word Hellion. Um, that moment, 
was visually different each time during the same run. Yeah. And and in two of the two of those instances in a vastly different way. So yeah, it's 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 a, it's a show that can adapt to keep creeping people out, and I'm just so happy that someone has listened to us rabbit about it and gone, oh, I'll check it out, and it happened, and you got to see it on stage as well, which is a bonus. Hmm. Congratulations and congratulations, us, for talking for two plus hours. Yay! Uh, here Not on the four big hours. Downcast. Uh, yeah, take that, episode 150. Yeah! We are 152. Uh, 152 here and there. If you want to hear us again, 153. All you got to do is look for the subscribe or follow buttons, which will be around you somewhere. You can listen to us on iTunes, YouTube, or Spotify. Or just grab the RSS link and use it with whatever podcast application you prefer stick it straight into the veins even it seems to do the job yeah pocket cast dog catcher whatever um child catcher <laughs> did you know listen to us, play? listen to us whilst watching chitty bang bang on mute it would be like listening oh. to dark side of the moon um whilst watching wizard of oz <laughs> uh, but yeah uh check us all out on those formats listen, listen you obviously are on one of them at the moment while watching the 10 second loop of the dancing pikachu yes from the viral marketing do that and it'll be a happy gay uh, jamboree so um happy. speaking of gay jamboree so gay you can join us at all times on twitter at big damn cast Watch streams galore from twitch.tv slash big damn stream. Yes. And not only that, but we're available via carrier pigeon, though we don't feed them and we shan't return them. <laughs> <laughs> Till next time, we'll leave you with these improvised words at the same time, like a pair of psychic weirdos. Ooh, Ooh my, my dog's, dog's got, got a, a lovely set, set of balls. balls. Goodbye. Let's hope their dreams are sweet. She's a girl, though.